Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Chartered Institute of Marketing Financial Services Summit. I'm so pleased to welcome, welcome you all here today. We've got more than 680 people registered, so a fantastic audience. Uh, last year, our summit was in person, and we, we only had space for 70. So this year has been a very difficult and challenging year, but uh, there are also opportunities to be found. And here, we're now able to bring this summit to a much wider audience than last time. And, and going forwards, we'll probably have more of a hybrid approach where we have a smaller gathering in person and a larger one where we can invite everyone in the world to share best practices around financial services marketing. We have a fantastic agenda today. And if you'd like to tweet along, um, you can tweet along at hash C-I-M-F-S-S. -S. This is a, a, a public event and we'll be recording it, and each session will be shared afterwards. But please do ask questions. There's a question panel just on the right. So as we go out the uh, whole day, please uh, ask questions of the panel, and then each moderator of each panel will pick up those questions and uh, ask the panelists your questions. So we hope to make it as interactive as we can. So coming to the agenda for this morning. Uh, I should just briefly introduce myself. Uh, I'm Jacob Howard, the chair of the Chartered Institute of Marketing Financial Services Group, and also vice president of marketing at Deutsche Bank. We have a fantastic agenda for today. Uh, we have a what's next for financial news with an interview with Francesco Guerrera. Uh, at 9.20, we have a, a really uh, fascinating panel with the Bank of England and Bino, two partners you might not expect to be together, all around financial literacy. And at 9.55, we have digital content marketing in the post-COVID world. Now, if that doesn't appeal to you, you're in the wrong place. Right, so I'm now going to introduce our two moderators for the day. I'd like to ask Amy Peters, Group Head of Marketing and Comms at Mashro Bank, and Christoph Wurman, CMO of the Corporate Bank at Deutsche Bank. Good morning, both. Good morning. Good afternoon from here, but hello. Well, uh, also welcome from uh, from us. Uh, Amy and I, as you probably know from uh, from last year, uh, um, we can only be in the 2D version with you, but we are really excited uh, about this conference. Uh, the good thing is, Jacob just said, it's uh, more than uh, last year's attendee uh, numbers digitally. Let's make sure that we make this as interactive as possible. Clearly, uh, Amy and I are brimming with energy so should you. So uh, let's kick off the day. Yeah, we're really excited. It's great for me to be able to join. Um, I had such a fantastic time with you all last year. I'm now in Dubai, um, but bringing an international perspective, I hope. Um, I'm really looking forward to chatting to some fantastic guests, um, which brings us nicely on to our first guest, I believe. Christoph, would you like to do the introductions? Well, um, as you just heard, uh, we've got Francesco Guerrera, the head of International Barons Group. Uh, we'll, uh, uh, will will uh, talk to us uh, about his experience uh, in uh, the uh, current uh, situation. So, Francesco, if you're with us, uh, please um, uh, come on. There you are. Fantastic. So, Francesco, well, you are one of the leading business journalists, uh, and you worked in the UK, in Europe, and Asia, uh, and you are uh, leading also an award-winning team of editors. So, who is better positioned than you to talk to us? a little bit uh, about uh, what's next for financial news. So uh, welcome on stage. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, thank you. Thank you both. Yes. Um, well, I suspect we should start from the extraordinary year we just had, all of us just had. And certainly in the media, we felt it both because of what we were reporting on, but also uh, the, the challenges that we all faced, uh, as every company faced, uh, in, in our news gathering, our reporting. I mean, I guess if I were to set the scene for what just happened in the past year, a year that's been traumatic and, and dramatic for, for, for many people, I think three things happened to us uh, in the media, certainly um, in, in our organizations, in our publications, but I think across the media landscape is one, all of a sudden, and without really that much forewarning, we had to go remote, uh, virtually uh, produce the publication that we produce. Many of us produce print publication that creates its own challenges. Uh, and if, in our experience, when we went remote, so when the whole of Dow Jones decided to close the London office, and I'm based in London, uh, we didn't know how long this was going to last, right? So 
So uh, many of us kind of fled uh, as soon as possible, but we didn't know when we would be back in. So I know, for example, a colleague of mine the other day asked me whether she could go back into the office, uh, which has been closed for months, because she had left a lot of shoes in there, right? So it's that kind of stuff. She didn't know that, uh, naturally, that we, we would be away for so long. In practice, that has affected our job, although I would say that I was amazed, and I'm sure that's true of all publications, uh, I was amazed at how quickly we were able to adapt and make it work. I mean, if you think about your experience as a reader, as a user of content, there was no interruption, right? There was no moment in which you felt that the media wasn't doing its job because of the pandemic uh, logistical challenges, right? And that, I'm very proud of that. For, on behalf of my colleagues in my, our industry, we were able to actually perform uh, as well as we could, even remotely, thanks to technology, thanks also to the work of, of all our colleagues. Now, the one thing that was affected was our news gathering, right? So imagine how we get our news, we go out and meet people, interview people, it's mostly done face to face. We as editors always encourage the reporters to do it face to face because you get more out of it, right? Naturally, like any meeting, it's better in person, we encourage lunches and so on. And now all of a sudden that was taken away from us. So. So the one thing that happened was the logistical challenges, which I think we overcame quite well. Uh, and I can talk a little bit more about that, especially with the print products. That was quite a challenge. If you imagine uh, that normally when you do a print product, you just go over the uh, your colleague's desk and say, change the headline, make the font bigger. I don't like that. Put their photo like that. And now you're 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 back you're you're batting PDFs back and forward, right? And it's very difficult to see a page on the screen than it is when you see it on on a big screen. Uh, and, in, and so that logistical challenge, the news gathering challenge is interesting. So I, 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 I oversee a lot of copy, right? I see a lot of the raw copy that uh, my colleagues produce. And all of a sudden, I was noticing all these interviews um, without any color in it, right? Nothing. Uh, what did the person look like? What was their office like? What were they eating? What, 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 what were they? they and, and of course, why was that? Because they were looking at the screen a bit like, ah, so you can only see about, what, 15% of me? So, and if I'm clever enough, there's nothing behind me. So you can't tell what I read and what I'm like, you know, what my family looks like. So all the stuff that you would gather from an office interview, for example, even an office interview, you wouldn't be able to do that. So, so that was something that uh, we had to overcome as well. So my suggestion to my colleague was always go get more color, ask them where they are, uh, tell us uh, what they're wearing, you know, what, how are they coping with lockdown and all things that are, became the norm. Uh, we needed to communicate to our readers, right? Because otherwise, we did, we weren't representing the moment. We were just representing some words, and that's something that we. Uh, and and I think if you look at other media, you'll see that that's happened happened quite uh, regularly. I think. Um, and then two other things happened, right? One was already happening, but I think it was exacerbated by the crisis, by the pandemic, and this is the the polarization, balkanization of news, and the. Uh, the spread of uh, mis misinformation, right? Bit about the economy, the markets, uh, politics, the vaccine, health. There was a lot of that happening. So that raised the stakes for all the uh, uh, high level professional publications, raised the stakes even higher. I mean, our job became even more important than normal. We, we, need, we need to be accurate. We, did, we needed not to so panic. We needed to be very clear about what was happening in our case. It's mostly the markets, but you know, it, and business journalists. But that's very important. What, what was happening, covering something like a vaccine. So today, uh, the United Kingdom became the first Western country to authorize a vaccine, uh, and this is a big milestone in the in kind of in the history, in recent history. Uh, but covering the vaccine stories, which also led to sharp spikes in the in the uh, shares of the companies that were producing these vaccines, was very something that we had to do in a very balanced, very um, neutral unbiased manner because there was not just obviously the health of millions of people at stake but also the hopes of millions of people at stake as well as considerable amount of money and, and important political consideration so that raised the stakes in the face of a tide of misinformation that only grew bigger during the pandemic uh, my theory as to why it grew bigger by the way is because people were even more insulated so the silo the eco chambers uh, got bigger because uh, you are at home you have much more control on your media diet, and there is an ecosystem that encourages you to stay in a silent and echo chamber. So the serendipity of news that you would find when you commute, talk to other people, uh, share ideas with colleagues, 
meet contacts or, or, or rivals, you didn't have that quite as much, right? So the, hey, have you heard this, was less prevalent uh, in a moment in which we were all like confined to our own bubbles. But just a theory. And then just from our Yes, Amy, of course. Jessica, can I pick up on that? Because I think there's a really interesting point there between trust and the thing that you said earlier about colour. And I just love your opinions on how much you think um, your readers are really buying into a style and a tone and, and how that develops trust in and of itself. And if you are in this echo chamber, which is sort of a similar point, but slightly different, how do you break through? You know, so as, as an editorial team, you know, what are you thinking about in terms of breaking through into those um, horrendous chambers? So we, we see it in two, in two ways. It's a very good question. Right? One is we, we have a duty to the to the readers uh, and subscribers and members who are engaged with us, right? So they know us, right? So they have sometimes literally bought into us. So they actually pay for our content. So we have a, a tremendous amount of uh, uh, duty towards them. And the duty towards them is to make sure that they uh, get the accurate, uh, uh, unbiased, non-misinformed information that they need to get, right? So that's one thing. So these are, this, this, this is our members, right? We call them actually members, not readers, not subscribers, we call them members. We think of them as members. So we have to give them more than just info. And then we also have a, a duty to the people who are not our members, but come to us, and maybe they come to us because of a Google search or a, or a Facebook uh, feed or something. We need to make sure that they know that we are accurate, that we know we give them the best possible information. And that's, in a way, more difficult because the members already know us. Uh, we need to persuade the other cohort, uh, which is many cohorts, that we are trustworthy enough for them to actually engage with our content. So, two different challenges. Um, and in a world where this is all being done digitally, um, you know, how are you tracking that? What are your tips and tricks, I guess? Yeah, so I think this is actually the good news, right? Technology has enabled us to be a lot, there's a lot of bad bad press on technology, right? But I, I'm actually positive on it. I think technology has enabled people in my position to be a lot more uh, informed and therefore make better, hopefully, make better decisions, right? So I'm old enough to remember when we didn't have technology in journalism and it was like sending a message in a bottle, right? It, it, the, the classic thing was the editors used to say, uh, our readers want to read that, but it was just their opinion. Right? They didn't know for sure. <laughs> and we also believed them because they were the editors, right? So it was just informed speculation on their part, informed by their experience for sure, but they weren't sure. Now we can be sure, right? We can measure it, right? You can see, we can see what does well, what doesn't do well, how people engage with it, what do they do afterwards, um, what else, uh, where they came from. Uh, this gives us a tremendous amount of uh, uh, the ability to tweak our content and to shape our content. There's of course the extreme example of that, which is that you just follow the data, right? If you follow, if you just follow the data, you give your readers an unbalanced media diet because you only give them what they want. So you only give them potatoes. You only give them chips because they like chips, comfort food. But what they need is they need the chips and they need the veg vegetables, right? The vegetables are what we think is important, and you know we still kind of that's our job to curate and filter what they think is important. And our job is to pre present it with a very wholesome and very varied meal. Right, and they can pick and choose, of course, but we present them with everything. Right, so technology is not—it's a guide. It's not a, a master, shall we say? Well, Jessica, here's a question from the audience: um, What uh, uh, could you give as top tips uh, for marketeers who are leading editorial teams, based on your experience uh, so far? If, and, and that's another great development in our industry, right? The, the companies have developed newsrooms, uh, and I, my 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 suggestion is always to run it as close as possible to a real newsroom, right? That means hiring real journalists, uh, and uh, there are many uh, good journalists who are willing to have that experience, uh, and to run it with news values, right? Um, because uh, in the end, the news values don't change, right? I mean, it's it's some of the things I said before, and many others, but I think that's uh, the try and be on the news, try and be as engaging as possible with your audience. Think of your audience, know your audience, and give them interesting content, content that they will find interesting. Um, I think, by the way, that your industry does that a lot. Uh, I see bad examples where it's just propaganda, and I think the audience is smart enough to know 
the best propaganda. I mean, we are talking now about some of the most sophisticated audiences we will ever face in our professional lives, just because they got so much choice, right? So yes, there's a lot of misinformation, but these people are very, very savvy. So they also have so much choice that they can click away in a second. So your job, our job, and the job of the marketing, in-house marketing teams, is to keep them engaged with our content. Uh, so the closer you are to new, to, re to real news, the better in my view. I think you made a very good point in terms of engaging uh, content, and that actually leads back to what you said in the opening that you know a journalist picks up some other stuff than just the information when seeing somebody face to face, and that usually is a good lead up uh, into a story where you frame where you're coming from, and then you go into the topic, and usually you close them with this kind of emotional uh, linkage. And it's actually absolutely right what you say for. Uh, financial marketeers uh, when you talk relevant stories it's it's about a story it's not just about facts or product or services uh, or feature or benefits because um, also th there was a question in this audience that's not really directly a question to you but it's a question that we as moderators can answer is it about the fact with the trend of selling financial products uh, online uh, with this trend uh, compared to face-to-face -face, uh, personal interaction uh, prevail after COVID-19? I would say clearly, yes, it is. We've seen, yesterday I was in, the, in a discussion with The Economist and uh, there was uh, a gentleman there from the automotive industry and said, in the past, we couldn't have uh, thought that anyone would buy a car uh, online. And now that experience is there and it, it's here to stay. So it's, it will always be a good mix. And that will lead me back to a question to you because you uh, said, Funnily, I, I love that, uh, that you are in cold control of your media diet. So tell us, what is the best media diet post and during COVID? Well, it depends who you are, right? If you're me, my media diet is this kind of ginormous buffet, Las Vegas style, Las Vegas casino style buffet of media, because I need to consume as much as possible because I need to kind of absorb what everybody else is doing, right? So people in my position are probably over consuming media because that's our job. But I think if, if you're, if, for a financial marketeer, my suggestion is always to be, uh, to have your core, your core publications, the ones that you really go to every day or multiple times a day. And then also have something a little like, you know, from left field, you know, because that's where you're gonna get the ideas that perhaps you don't see, perhaps outside your, your sector. Uh, personally, I, I like to look at a, a lot of magazines and publications that are not in finance just to see if we can steal some ideas, right? Uh, and, and personally, we, we've taken ideas that we use in our publication uh, from food magazines, lifestyles magazines, sports magazines. And when I say magazines, I mean digital publications, of course. So I think it's important not to be too ring fenced in your own industry, even though obviously that's your core. Uh, but also think about something left field that perhaps you like and how would it apply, how would it work in your industry? And you're blessed because you're in, in your industry, marketing, there's so much going on in, in so many industries, a fascinating place, right? And so much innovation, perhaps even more so than in the media at the moment. Um, one final thought, um, maybe we should answer the question, what is next for financial news? You know, in, if you've got a 30 second, how's it doing? How are you doing? Um, just So there's a lot of like, you know, uh, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, pessimism right, around, right? And I mean, journalists are great at pessimism. They're, they're basically, that's a stocking trade. But I think actually I would want to leave on a note of optimism. I think technology is for the first time not an enemy for us in this uh, situation. It's freeing us. We are much better at having identified the business models that work. Now we need to execute the business model that work. We are finding new ways to partner with companies. Custom content, we didn't talk about it. Custom content is a fantastic area. For the readers as well, for the for the viewer as well, you know, we we getting some great results on custom content. So I think financial news has a bright future, which is going to be driven by, by technology, curated by journalists, in part, and there's going to be more and more partnership with marketing and companies. That's a that's a great close. Couldn't have done it better, um, Christoph. Well, thank you so much, Francesco. Uh, you've really uh, uh, engaged our audience here because the good thing is uh, I see on my panel loads of questions uh, flying in. Let's see whether we can also possibly answer some of the questions offline. So uh, I will ask Jacob to fire them to you and we can then see that we find a way of answering uh, uh, those questions online. So thank you very much, Francesco. Thank Francesco. you. Thank Please you. stay with us here. Let's move on uh, to our next uh, 
agenda point, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, uh, this is really uh, something that's also close to uh, our hearts uh, here in the financial service industry is the promotion of financial literacy. So uh, we're going to learn here a little bit uh, about the unique uh, partnership between the Bank of England and, uh, and Bino. And uh, uh, today our high profile guests uh, at our conference are Fiona Hickley, the Executive Director, Brand Marketing and Strategic Partnerships at the Bino. And for those of you who don't know the Bino, I'll uh, tell you in one second. And we've got Andrew Hadden, the Head of Outreach and Education at the Bank of England. So Fiona and Andrew, can I ask you to switch on your cameras and to unmute your line? There we are, fantastic, it goes like clockwork. So uh, I tell you, uh, look, um, here's a little cue, uh, folks. Uh, if any one of you don't know the famous Vino uh, comic, which is actually the, lo the longest running com a con a comic in the United States, uh, sorry, in the United Kingdom, <laughs> And uh, for those of you who don't know, just look at Fiona, then it gives you a slight hint. Um, there is someone called Dennis the Menace, and uh, I will not tell you more exactly. So uh, with this, um, over the next 35 minutes, we are going to discuss this uh, partnership uh, that we had just mentioned and how both of uh, the organization have modernized their approach to digital marketing and communications. Um, so, um, but. Um, uh, let's first of all uh, introduce um, our guests, and usually I start with uh, the woman first. I will, and you will see why later on, I will, however, start with Andrew. So, uh, Andrew, uh, can you please outline the Bank of England's uh, outreach and education uh, strategy for us here when you introduce yourself? Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, and, and I just, I was wondering if Fiona was going to be sporting those colours. Um, we've done a, an event with uh, Bino before, and um, I think this is a bit of a, uh, a common theme. Um, so I fittingly got like, it looks like I've got a grey top on, which is very Bank of England, isn't it? Um, so yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, um, my, my role, as you say, is head of outreach and, and education at, at the bank. Um, I sit in the communications um, directorate. Um, outreach and education covers quite a broad span of what we do. Um, it's about getting out there and engaging with the public, um, engaging with all our different stakeholders, in fact, as well as running our education program. Um, I just think, just by way of introduction, um, I think uh, perhaps a few years ago, the idea of the Bank of England having a spot at a conference like this might have seemed quite unlikely. Um, it's not that long ago that the bank's marketing and communication strategy consisted of two elements, principally, uh, an annual speech by the governor at Mansion House and the uh, novel instrument, shall we say, of the raised eyebrow uh, during a fireside chat in the parlours. Um, hopefully uh, you've all um, spotted that we've come a little way since then, but even so, the notion of the Bank of England teaming up with the, B the Bino uh, to create resources for primary schools might seem a little far-fetched to, to many of you, but I just thought um, I'd just explain a little bit about why this matters to us. Um, we've uh, gone on a journey over the last few years to basically shift from a, a communication strategy which is very much based around our what you might call traditional core audiences. So they'd be financial markets participants and the journalists who report on the financial markets. And in order to reach them, it's all about developing complex, carefully crafted reports and statements. Um, to a much broader form of uh, communication uh, with a, a larger part of the of the general population. Ultimately, our mission statement is all about serving the um, the public of the United Kingdom. Um, so we think it's actually quite important that we 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 talk to them. But that's 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 difficult, right? Because um, the general public do not by instinct sort of check the Bank of England website every day for their news. They don't necessarily follow the Bank of England on Twitter. So how do we engage with the public um, on what can sometimes be the quite dry stuff that we think is important and is important, indeed important to them, but they don't necessarily under know that. Uh, so about four years ago, we set out on a st new strategic strategic plan, if I can say it, which is all about um, changing the way we communicate. Um, it's about simplifying some of the messages, but in doing so, we have to be really careful because often our messages are deliberately quite nuanced. Um, you know, we can have to, we have to be very careful what we what we say because those technical audiences that follow every word of uh, of, our, of our of our communications will will attach uh, significant meaning to them. So we have to be very careful. Um, 
but, but but essentially at the heart of our strategy um, are what we call three E's, right? So explanation, engagement, and education, and obviously come to the education at the end with the Beano uh, story. But um, the explanation was all about simplifying our messaging. Um, we did this in a number of ways, but probably the most high profile was developing different uh, layers of content. So having, so our, our key uh, publication, which is, used to be called Inflation Report, now the Monetary Policy Report, where we talk about the forecast for the UK economy, we talk about the uh, interest rate decision. We, um, instead of just having one big sort of 50 page document, which goes into a huge level of detail, we developed different layered communication to sit on top of that so that you, those key messages could be communicated more widely. Um, Engagement, changing the way we engage has meant doing more on social media. We've still got a long way to go, but you know we, we have made progress. Doing direct public engagement, and that's a big part of my role, is developing new ways of communicating with the public through different forums. So we set up citizens panels across the UK. We run regular events with charities to hear from lesser heard groups. Um, and, uh, and and a variety of other sort of initiatives to to have actually direct channels with the public rather than relying necessarily on the traditional media to sort of um, get the message out there. And then finally, education. Um, so that's education of everybody. So we've tried to um, reach audiences and educate in a subtle way through things like a TV documentary, which we did with the BBC um, about 18 months ago. You may have seen it inside the Bank of England, which is all about sort of hopefully demystifying what the Bank of England is and uh, shine a light on the people who work there. Um, uh, we developed something called Knowledge Bank, which is where we try to explain economics in, in, in layman's terms. And then our education programme, which is um, Two, well, there's a number of aspects to it. One of them is going out and doing school talks. We've got 500 bank ambassadors who go out to state schools around the UK to talk um, about the work of the bank. We developed some secondary school resources called Economy a few years ago, which um, are all about uh, showing to 13, 14, 15 year olds why the economy and indeed by by by, by connection to the world the bank of england is in rel is important and relevant to them as the in the decisions that they make and their and their and their lives and then the beano so the 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 partnership with the beano and 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 tez as well who've been a, a third partner in this is all about um primary schools and and reaching a different audience and by using the sort of heft of the institutional sort of reputation and uh, of the bank of england and the sort of fun uh, the fun side of things that we know, I'm hoping that we can begin to address some of those massive issues around financial literacy, which I think we're all aware of, and which uh, as an institution, we also feel we have a kind of public duty to, to, to play our part in trying to address. That's a perfect PR, uh, TF for Fiona, Andrew. And now you know why I've asked uh, you uh, uh, to come first, because that built up the, the the good introduction for Fiona. So Fiona, welcome here on stage and also Thank you very much. Uh, explain to us. Uh, so, you know, tell us a little bit about the Bino brand and tell us also about how you invigorated that, that brand uh, and then later on, um, you know, uh, how it came to the partnership. So welcome, Fiona. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I am finding myself wondering how on earth I got to be talking to a conference of finance marketing managers uh, alongside the Bank of England. Um, Bino has taken me in very wonderful ways and places that were unexpected. Um, I've had a career in kids marketing entertainment and so I'm a complete duck out of water in your finance world but um, I do know about storytelling and um, I, we have got a really good story to tell about what we've done with Bino and reinvigorated our brand and our business over the last few years. Um, and the way we primarily do that is through really knowing our audience, um, which is six to 12 year old children and their families. And we have really detailed insight um, that um, uh, informs everything we do. And that's the path that led us to be talking to Andrew and the Bank of England and to be being here today. So um, to tell you a bit more about Beano, we're an 82 year old British institution. Uh, it's a quirky, iconic national treasure. Um, but it, as you said, Christoph, it's, it's the last surviving weekly comic in the world. And, and we were primarily a print publication in a declining market. And we'd become a retro brand. Um, so five years ago, DC Thompson, our owners, took a really bold, brave step 
and created Beano Studios, a separate company, effectively as a startup. And in those five years, we've completely revamped the brand and looked at it from what do modern British and international now kids need and what, how are they consuming their media? And so what we've done is um, we've created um, animation. Uh, we've created real high quality Pixar animation, uh, which um, was commissioned by the BBC. Um, it's the, the series is called Dennis and Asher Unleashed. So we had a 52, our first series was 52 episodes that aired on the BBC, um, Emmy nominated, and we've sold that to 100 countries around the world. So I'm delighted to tell you that Dennis is now being broadcast globally we're taking um, British humour around the world. Um, the second series is now running on, on BBC and we're selling that around the world too. Um, a big bit of what we did, a very large bit of what we did was create a digital network and platform centred around Beano.com, um, which isn't the comic digitally. It's a, in the spirit of the comic, safe, funny, entertaining place for kids to, to go and be online. And we're just shy of two million users a month on that. So that's going incredibly well. And then after all of that, the printed comic has had a massive resurgence through all this other brand work we've done. Um, in the last three years, we've had double, double digit growth for circulation each of the last three years. And um, in lockdown, um, since lockdown started, we have doubled our subscriber numbers for the comic. Um, you know, lots and lots of families have discovered the value of having something arrive through your letterbox every Saturday morning very reliably that the whole family can enjoy. And so that's been a really um, fantastic success for us. Um, and, you know, in Kent's an incredibly declining print market, we are very much bucking the trend. Um, when we set up Beano Studios, one of the very first things we did was uh, set up an insight panel of kids from across the UK and across different socio-demographic groups. And since then, our insight and research team have talked to those children every single week. Um, we call them our trend spotter panel and our research team are our Beano brain. And Beano brain informs everything that we do. Um, and we talk to those children about what they're interested in, what they're doing, um, how they're feeling. and this year in particular, I mean, it's always fascinating, but this year you can imagine it's been extraordinary to get that kind of insight from this cohort of, of children. And we now have 40 we speak to um, um, most weeks. Um, and Being a Brain has now become a healthy revenue stream for our business. Um, we sell those trend spotter reports, our map of hotness, which shows what is going in and out and of kids' interest. Um, and um, we also do bespoke uh, research and insight projects for companies because more and more companies know that children and this generation of children are so influential in their families' purchasing powers and they're a real activist group of children and generation. Um, and, more, and more companies and organisations realise that talking to those people is important for their future um, and what we can do at Beano is we do that we get the tone right we've been talking to children for 82 years we know how to do it with the right tone the right humor not patronizing um, and that's a really tricky difficult skill um, and in 2018 we set up Beano for schools which is a website where teachers can download free very high quality curriculum linked lesson plans. Um, and we've tackled quite challenging subjects, quite intentionally. We like, we like doing that at Beano. We have a long history of doing it. Um, so we have done lesson plans on things like SPAG, which teachers and year six pupils hate, spelling, punctuation and grammar, um, emotional well-being, and um, also comic comprehensions. And that work got us noticed. Um, and because we were able to do it in a way that um, engaged audiences and engaged, and our audience in this case is both kids and teachers. Um, and that is what got us invited through the heavy security uh, at the Bank of England and into those beautiful corridors. And um, together 
we created Money and Me. It's 12 lessons. I think we've got them up on the screen now. Some of them you can see. Um, uh, there, it's a set of 12 lessons for Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2. So that goes right the way up through primary school. Um, and um, that is the end of my story. Well, fantastic introduction and uh, many, many points raised uh, here, Fiona. First of all, I think you know for the community here of, of marketeers, one of the big messages that you that you already sent by uh, explaining to us how you invigorated Bino, that you didn't just succumb to the fate of saying, okay, we're a print magazine, print is no longer that much uh, in fashion, kids are digital. Oh no, let's you know let's see how we can get out out, out of here without uh, licking our wounds too much. You you just took it the bulls by its horns. You have. Um, reinvigorated the, the brand the idea of a sort of brand uh, advisory panel and uh, uh, and this with kids and then developing out of uh, this a separate product like a transfer product that's exactly the message for marketers to say just think think outside the box and also how it links and that's a question to andrew because you know, andrew you know like many banks who are seen as sort of you know uh, uh, top to bottom, uh, we are here and, and the world is out there. Uh, the Bank of England is, is seen a bit more like a stuffy institution uh, that then can use uh, this quirky brand to sort of, you know, uh, to to be a bit more modern. And that's not really the point, but certainly a certain a part of it is true, though. So tell us then, uh, you know, how this partnership went off, and then explain a little bit what Fiona has done, how it fits in uh, overall. So walk us through the, the program in reality, because it's not a program where me as a parent can just click a few websites, it's more via school. So explain to our audience a little bit the program uh, and uh, what you have achieved so far in financial literacy. Uh, and did you want to start? Yeah, I can I can do that. I'm, I'm feeling it may, may, may well want to come in on the, on the last bit. So, um, I mean, in terms of your, 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 your very good point about how a partnership like this can begin to challenge some of the perhaps stereotypes about um, an institution like the Bank of England. I think that's absolutely that's absolutely right. It comes back to my sort of original point, my opening remarks about uh, the difficulty we have in engaging sort of stakeholders beyond that sort of very small um, importance, but but technical community that we've traditionally talked to. Um, you know, the, we, we've got a huge you know we're very privileged um at the bank of england i feel very proud of working there but also very honored that you know uh, we we have a reputation that dates back you know all the way to 1694 um and you know what comes with that in terms of the sort of trust um uh reliability um uh and, and that's very very valuable you can't build that from scratch so so you know it's about it's about embracing that and, and honouring that, but at the same time also thinking about how we move forward as well and, and 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 broaden our reach and get people to understand that the modern bank is, you know, respects all those traditions, but at the same time is very much a modern institution and and actually importantly a diverse institution and that's certainly a work in progress in terms of getting that message out there to sort of um, get behind the sort of huge security big walls in in the city and get people to understand that this is a diverse institution that actually looks relatively like the people that it serves um and i think you know this partnership with bino is is a really great example of how partnerships can can begin to do that just by by surprising by by bringing together two two different partners who bring different different things to to that partnership um so so that's been that's been really exciting and it's you know it's a, it's a model we'll certainly look to sort of do in, in other ways as we begin to sort of on this continue on this sort of modernization journey in terms of our communications um into i mean i don't know if you, you know if you want to talk through the more sort of specifics around around the actual program itself i mean the I said that there is an important third partner in this in, in Tez who we shouldn't forget because as, as Fiona rightly says, um, actually the audience for this isn't in many ways not kids, it's <laughs> teachers because teachers are the way you get to the kids and you know that might seem a really obvious point but actually it's it's kind of critical <laughs> because you can have the best resources in the world but if teachers don't know about them um, and aren't putting them in front of the kids then, um, then it's a waste of time. So um, We've been uh, amazed 
uh, you know, really pleasantly surprised by the, the pickup, um, which is massive testament to the quality of the resources themselves, but also the channels that we've used to get to the teachers. Um, you know, we, we, we had in the first few weeks, you know, literally over 60,000 downloads of the resources, you know, within you know, the first month or so, which was, which was fabulous, you know, and that's, um, and that's spread right across the UK. So one of the key things for us was to make sure that these, these materials were aligned with the curriculum, another key point in in all four of the devolved uh, of the nations of the of the uk um that was really important to us as the central bank for the whole of the uk obviously um and those the, the materials are downloaded um either f through tez or through the bino website and there's links to to both from the bank of england education uh, resources as well and we've also got a plan to develop these further by creating some sort of home learning resources, which are just sort of in train as well. But I don't know, Fiona, if you want to pick up on any of that in a bit more detail. Um, yes, I can tell you a little bit more about the lessons and, and how what our starting point was. The, the bank already did have a primary lesson programme that was quite old and it needed updating. So some of it was absolutely fine. And so some of the, the, the younger lessons were about things like how did currency start? Um, bartering, um, inflation, supply and demand, those, those things didn't change. Um, so those we took and we updated them and we beano fied them, which means is that we added these lovely illustrations and we added Beano's sense of humour to it all. Um, but there are other things that um, Tez, who, who worked with us on the content and us, brought, brought and thought that should be new. So we've got um, lessons in there about um, keeping your money safe, which a lot of it is about uh, like online fraud and and checking and and being aware of that. Um, there's another program about um, all the different ways that you can pay for things now, and we've got games about sort of bingo games about choosing and making sure that you're choosing or sensibly choosing which um, which kind of form of payment you use for different in different situations. Uh, there's another program in the, in the higher age range about ethical spending and how you can use your money to influence things and make good choices about what you buy that's a good uh, that's a good one and then um uh there was another one i was thinking about oh it's a really important one about what is debt um and and obviously in this day and age that's a really important lesson um so those are the new elements and then what we've also did not not in every lesson but scattered throughout is we've got lots and lots of games so um children and sometimes it's in a small group sometimes it's in a whole class group can play a game of shopkeepers and change you know have a situation where every 10 minutes everyone can change their prices and um play with supply and demand there's another game called spend save and borrow where ch children can decide whether or not they want to um earn interest or pay interest on a loan and where that sort of levels out at the end there's some really fun games that we've we've brought to the classroom oh fantastic i mean look i think we can go uh, endlessly uh, in this one because uh, it shows how fascinating finance is and if you say if you can uh, beautify it <laughs> put it into entertaining content uh, context then uh, then of course this is en engaging um, it's so also it's also worth saying, sorry, Christoph. It's also worth saying that you don't have to be a teacher to download these. If you want to download them as a parent and do them with your children, they're free. You can you can do that, and we have had lots of feedback from parents. Um, yeah. We, we are, as as Andrew said, we are going to produce a version that is more parent friendly, um, and that wouldn't have national curriculum links and things like that. But as a parent, you can totally access and use these. A hundred percent, and. Um... Uh, our observation is it's not only just at the level of, of, of kids uh, to teach financial literacy. You'll be surprised how many um, uh, students when they leave uni have very little experience and sort of the real financial literacy. Of course, they've got a current account and usually uh, student debt, but you know, not more than that. We, we, we see in the financial service industry, there's a, there's a lot to, to be done also to explain uh, our uh, our uh, products and services are better and more easily because usually most of the groups uh, tend to have their own acronyms and that's almost like the the wall, the impermeable wall where people say, okay, I don't understand it, and then okay, fine. But um, you know, it's it, it's very easy uh, uh, usually once you understand it, and and that actually brings me back to to Andrew 
because you now have positive experience with Fiona and she's, as you uh, are all experienced here, brimming with creativity. Would you uh, consider other partnerships based on this experience and uh, how has this journey also uh, affected the, the public perception of the Bank of England? Do you have already something that points in this direction? Yeah, so so we've, um, I mean, we, we've, we, we, as part of our sort of uh, communication strategy that we launched a few years ago, we actually created a sort of partnerships role, which is actually what I used to do. I used to do, um, and that was all about thinking about different partners we could work with and who could open doors in different ways and help us communicate and um, and and in, in novel ways. Um, so yeah, absolutely, uh, and we use partnerships in all sorts of in all sorts of different ways sometimes they are like this with a this is a long-standing you know um you know detailed relatively you know complex partnership in terms of develop developing something at scale like this some of the some of the ones we do are much more informal um and are playing a really important role in some of that wider public engagement stuff that we're doing so i talked briefly about sort of the citizens panels and the community forums that we run around the country what we're doing there is we're partnering with local charities in local communities who can help us to reach um, different groups of people who, again, would never, you know, much the same as most um, primary school children wouldn't think about sort of looking to the Bank of England for, for, for information. You know, there's, there's, there's a huge amount of society that has no idea what the Bank of England does. Um, so, th so these partners are helping us to sort of bridge that understanding gap and access these 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 groups um, and so we're working in all sorts of different ways with different partners on all sorts of different scales um, so so certainly keen to, to to do to do more of that kind of thing I think it's a huge opportunity in terms of measuring impacts um, I mean uh, on one level it's easy so we you know we, we seek feedback from teachers um, for the from, for, who use the materials and you know they can rate it on on these various websites as, as they do and, and the feedback uh, is great so far, as, as, as Fiona said. We've had some really positive feedback. Now, obviously, that's that's one level. I mean, ultimately, the success, the long-term success of a project like this, will be to see what happens to those um, children that use the resources, and to see ultimately how it affects their understanding, their choices of what top subjects they're going to take at school. I mean, one of the things we're really keen to do is to encourage more kids to take economics, for example, because there's a real diversity challenge in economics. And that's another partnership we're involved in uh, called Discover Economics, which is all about um, basically getting more um, girls and um, uh, uh, kids, kids from a different socioeconomic um, and more um, ethnically diverse backgrounds to consider economics, because it has a bit of a reputation problem in terms of being seen as, um, uh, you know, for a certain group of people with a certain type of interest. So, so we're doing other stuff in that kind of space, but ultimately we would love to see the kids who do this program come out of the other end making better financial decisions. Obviously, that's a really long term sort of outcome and, uh, and it's going to be a tricky thing to measure, but it's something we're really keen to think about how we do that. Uh, we do obviously run public polling as well, which looks at things like levels of understanding in the Bank of England and 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 and, and how we're regarded and how we compare with other institutions like, you know, you'd expect us to. And, and, you know, all of this work is, it's, you know, the, the, the challenge for us as ever is the Bank of England's reputation will often be shaped by the news um, and the, the economy around us and decisions taken by others. Um, so it's, it's a really hard thing to measure at that kind of macro scale. We do measure it. Um, and I think we're making progress, but it's but it's a hard one to sort of impact in the short term. And I think it's a long term game in terms of uh, how all this stuff ultimately will work through to those really wider levels of public understanding. But but where we do engage directly with people, we do change um, uh, understanding quite quickly and we do get really positive response. I think you I mean, th this program in, in itself shows that you're, you're making great strides and completely changing the view uh, and the perception of the Bank of England, because of course, as you say, currently Bank of England is uh, in most people's good books because the interest rate is so low, and that's usually uh, the factor where everybody. Not savers. Not savers. You're absolutely right. You can't, can't, can't win it all. Uh, but you're turning to the current uh, situation for a second, because surely that's a, like a, 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 a two-part question. First of all, is um, have you experienced that due to the pandemic uh, and that, that the program for schools, whilst yeah, online learning is, of course, the call of the day, 
but has this program been impeded by the fact that uh, everything turned digital to online learning that suddenly just to cope with the normal curriculum, um, uh, teachers couldn't just say, okay, well, let's park this financial literacy topic for a second because I need to go through the curriculum. So the first question, has the pandemic influenced the program? And secondly, then back to Vido itself, because you, you mentioned that luckily the print uh, 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 it is the desire for a printed magazine has increased. Do you think that post um, lockdown, post the whole situation, people will say, okay, that, that fit at the gap nicely. Let's go back to digital. So, you know, what, I, what are your answers to those two questions? Um, we'll start with the first one. We launched this program in July. So um, with the idea that when children went back to school, um, and they did go back to school in September, teachers would be able to, to use it. So um, no, it hasn't um, locked down and, and, and schools being closed didn't affect this programme. What we saw on our other Beano, um, Beano for Schools programmes was that um, take up actually went up because teachers were, and parents were desperately trying to find things online to, to teach at, at home. And so um, teachers were sending the links out to um, to parents and saying, "Go go download it and do the, do and do this with your with your children." What that's taught us, and and you know, this is a conversation we've been having with the bank and we're working on with the bank, is that we need to present materials that are parent focused as well as teacher focused. Um, so that's a direction that we we need to go in, and you know, it's something none of us would have thought about a year ago. Um, and your other question in terms of the comic, um, we've had growth in the comic for the last three years. Um, I and it's and it's and it's done incredibly well for us in lockdown. We lost we lost retail and we lost that retail um, part of our, our trade, although comics are on sale in supermarkets. So when we were in essential retail. But our our circulation figures are very, very healthy and our website figures were very, very healthy um, through through lockdown. Um, we certainly see a desire with families to enjoy something together. And I think that's, you know, lockdown has um, emphasized that. And Beano is, you know, three generations can enjoy the Beano together. Um, they all know it. Um, and, um, we all need something to make us laugh at the moment. Um, so um, I, we, we're we're very confident that, um, and, and I'm going to make sure that we keep we keep that growth up going up. It's 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 looking very good. That's super super confident and uh, a very positive uplifting message. So now in closing, we've got two more minutes left for this session. Uh, can I both ask you and start with Andrew? Sort of your final top tip uh, for financial service marketeers because both of you have pushed boundaries what would be your final tip uh, out of that experience if you were in the place sitting at a large financial institution or insurance company or what whatever and you you're doing what you're doing but you're trying to find a new angle is there anything that based on your experience you can provide as a top tip and then fiona from you because you have observed the financial service industry from a different angle what would be your top tip from somebody outside this industry? So Andrew first, then Fiona. Oh, um, uh, I'm no, I, I wouldn't cast myself as an expert, but I would I would say be be brave or be bold. Um, think outside the box. Um, I mean, I guess that's a bit of a cliche for for for, for this audience, but um, I'm thinking from our perspective. You know, if, if the Bank of England can do stuff like this, and you know. Um, be sort of different in terms of the the, the thinking around partnerships um, and communication. Then um, you know certainly I'm sure everyone in this audience today can can do it. Um, you know you can open doors uh, in all sorts of different ways if you think creatively about the partners that you work with. Um, you know the, the Bank of England is a very traditional institution. We could have taken a a different route with this even you know having made the decision that we should refresh and really push and invest in our education resources um we could have chosen a i guess a safer option 
than 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 going with someone like like Bino um, because you know it is this kind of quirky and off the wall and you know it was a there was a lot of discussion about it but at the end of the day I I remember sort of sitting in the first meet with Bino and seeing the sort of fun uh, the the the, the the prominent role that fun was going to play and games were going to play in these resources and immediately thinking we need to be working with these guys and so yeah be bold and be brave i would say thank you so much fiona last word to you i would say um our experience is to know your audience and to know how to talk to them and make it clear make it honest um and and talk to them get your tone right talk to them in the in the right way um because if you if you don't you'll just switch them off in the first sentence. Well, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. I'm really delighted to, uh, on behalf of everyone uh, on this virtual conference to have had you both here. So ladies and gentlemen, a big uh, digital applause for <laughs> Fiona Hickley <laughs> and Andrew Hatton. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you stay with us for a moment. Uh, so over to Amy for the next part of the agenda and our next guest. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have never had to follow the Beano and the Bank of England. I am fangirling over your sweater, Fiona, I love it. Um, and I think it's a, an absolute honour um, and really, really interesting. I know that we had loads of questions there. We are seeing your questions and trying to work them in, so please keep them coming. It's fantastic to hear from everyone. Um, I'm sure you appreciate that in a forum like this, it does feel a little bit like we're talking to ourselves. Um, so it's great to see your questions. It's great to see the numbers flashing around on this wonderful screen um, that the guys have set up. So um, I, I, I'm going to introduce my esteemed guests now to talk about digital content marketing. Um, so guys, I'm hoping you're looking in the backgrounds. Please switch on your screens. Let me introduce Eric Fulwell, who is the CCO um, for 11FS, Gunnar, um, Gunnar Steven, who is head of client marketing at Sockgen, and Kieran uh, Rogers, who I'm not seeing yet, but I'm hoping is lurking in the background, who is Marketing Director at Target Internet. Thank you, guys. Um, can you hear me? 2020 cliche. Can you hear me? Is my mic working? <laughs> yes, I can. Same question back to you, Amy. Can you hear me? Great. Yep, yep, we're all good. So um, I think we should just crack on and hope that, ah, there we are, Kieran. Great to see you. It's all Thank about you. pressing the right buttons. Yes, it good. is. So in life, <laughs> generally, I think that's just something we should all live by. Um, so we're here to talk about digital content marketing today. And I mean, who better to follow than the Bank of England and the Beano mashup? I mean, I thought that was a, a fantastic session, really pushing the boundaries of how we think about content um, and building those, you know, as well on Francesco's views on pure news and, and how we actually think about news gathering. And um, so really today, I think we start to think about, you know, how the speed and, um, you know, uh, complexity of the channels that we have available to us are starting to change some of the techniques that we employ and that we should think about employing. Um, and so I think the first um, point, because like with any good conference, we had a pre, we had a pre session and we had some great discussions. And so the very first one I'm going to throw to the team here is, um, has it really changed? You know, what's where? How far have we come from? Um, and I'm going to go to Gunnar first on that one. Um, so Gunnar, tell us tell us your views. Yeah, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here today and share my thoughts. Just to say, uh, my role pertains to the wholesale client market, so my comments are to, to be seen in that context. I'd like to open by uh, quoting Bill Gates, who once said that we overestimate the change that is going to happen in two years and underestimate the change that is happening in 10 years. The reason why I quote it is because I think that's pretty, pretty much precisely what's happened. Um, if we think back for a second, uh, you know, when big data was a big buzzword in the industry, this dates back to what six, seven, eight, nine years. And then what happened? Not really much. Um, and I think we only now start seeing uh, the introduction of digital tools um, to become smarter marketeers, smarter content marketeers. So uh, it's taking its time. Having said that, uh, I mean, a lot of ch things have changed in, in the last years. Um, I mean, there are digital channels. We've gone from print advertising to online advertising. Videos are being produced, social media. 
Um, I think one of the most striking features that I'm seeing is that we are seeing the composition of marketing and comms teams change. Uh, we still have the traditional um, uh, marketing and comms skills, but there are new additions, such as, for instance, data scientists and people who optimize search engines. And so that's a very clear sign to me that we are on the brink of what I would expect to be quite explosive growth in the next one to three years. Great. And um, Kieran, I think you had some thoughts on, on that as well when we spoke. <laughs> I do. I just, do you know what? I think people are people, right? That hasn't changed. And, and let's face it, if we're marketing, that's who we're trying to reach. We're trying to reach people. And I think, you know, and this might come as a bit of a shock, shocking revelation from from the the host of the digital marketing podcast but i don't i don't particularly believe in digital i think it's a false construct in a way like what, what do i mean by that i mean you know you go about your your lives i think we're, we're all too obsessed with oh this latest hack on google or facebook or you know gaming the algorithm you know i've, I've spent years of my life studying that but it all boils down to the fact that you, you as a marketer you're trying to reach people and you're trying to reach them with a great product, a great offer that's going to help them in some way. Right. And that, that's not changed. Um, you know, COVID-19 hasn't changed that. I think what, what has changed is, you, you know, their, their attention on different screens, different devices, um, different, different objects. But I think as marketers, we, we rush to all be in the same digital space. I think that's a mistake. I think, you know, how much attention is still being paid to people's doormats? The last time I checked, my doormat was not as busy as my inbox. And yet my inbox is where all the marketers are. Actually, it's not. They're all being screened out into the other stuff you also got sent that you don't care about. Right. But this yeah. is what we're all like literally ob ob obsessed about. And I think actually we need to take a step back from this like digital frenzy, this digital craziness and, and get back to actually getting our message across to people. And absolutely digital channels are a great way of doing that but not necessarily in isolation if you really want to cut through and you've got a great, great message. Yeah, well, as a direct marketer, oh, you've got my vote, but Eric, let's hear from you. <laughs> so I agree and I disagree. Uh, and I'm trying to think of the best way to kind of uh, voice my perspective and opinion on this. So I think that when we talk about change, there's the theoretical armchair debates around change in the industry, more the professorial you know, what do we see? What do we pontificate about when we have conversations as um, as an industry group or at events like this? And then there's the change that's actually, how are you driving the results of your business with the strategy and tactics that you have for your company and your audience? And I think it's much more about, you know, things are always changing, right? Fundamentally, innovation or disruption comes from technology creating new, better, cheaper ways to add value to an audience. And that is always happening. I don't think that's really debatable. But what matters much more on the practical level, because I think that's what really what what's going to be more valuable to people, is how much are you changing what you do within it? So I agree with Kieran in the sense that, and I think about that stuff all the time, um, people haven't changed in the 10 years. The fundamental dynamics and psychology of how do you change perception and behavior to deliver business results because that's what marketing is or at least should be at the end of the day that hasn't changed but the attention and where it is like kieran said definitely has changed and then i think the other dynamic that's super important within that is just because there is attention somewhere doesn't mean that you can reach people effectively in those places and at a price that makes sense for your business mm -hmm. so you need to be thinking about not just where is the attention but also how can you reach it effectively and efficiently and where's that arbitrage of attention where there is people paying attention, but maybe other marketers haven't caught up to that yet. So in that um, perspective, I do think it's important to stay on top of the changes that are happening because you know these are you know matters of sometimes three, six, nine months where you have an opportunity that other people haven't gotten to yet that can make a fundamental difference. So a lot of stuff hasn't changed, and I love that quote. I actually didn't know it was from Bill Gates, but I think that we do tend to, particularly when we are in our silo of talking to other marketers, uh, overestimate things and underestimate things, but it comes down to the practicalities of what are the results that you're driving. And I think there is change to take advantage of um, always. I agree. But um, one of the things that Francesco said earlier, which I wanted to sort of bring back in, and you may or may not have had a chance to hear that session, was around how ecosystems and echo chambers, sorry, um, are getting tighter and smaller. 
And I think there's an interesting point as we start to think about digital content marketing in how we break through some of those um, increasingly small bubbles that people are building in, in this sort of COVID um, phase. You know, can we necessarily go back to door, door drops um, if people are disinfecting everything that comes through their front door? You know, what, how do you need to think about things differently? Um, and I think, you know, there's an interesting challenge there for all of us to think about how digital breaks through and, and escapes the, you know, the others folder that we, that we all have and that we, we all know about. Um, and I'm not sure if that's a question too specifically, I think might go back to Eric on that one. Um, do you think that's something that we need to be thinking about? Do you think that's something that, you know, you guys are, are looking at, you know, yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, one thing that I think we don't talk about enough as marketers is, you know, I think a primary, if not fundamental role of marketing should be to improve the quality of the product or service, because at the end of the day, the best marketing is a great product. And so depending on what type of business you're in, that takes on a different role. But oftentimes in these conversations, we're talking about kind of the communication or the branding or the advertising component of it. But I think that that's, if you go back to the four Ps, Traditionally, that's such a big role of marketing um, that I think maybe doesn't get enough attention. But I think when it comes down to what are the channels, what are the content, how are you actually trying to engage with your audience? Um, I, I think what I would say to that, you know, not as much debating the specifics of what channel right now in COVID, but you need to have a hypothesis. But then most importantly, you need to be able to adapt quickly to the data that you're seeing and the feedback that you're getting from people. So I think oftentimes we can think, uh, you know, we talk a lot about being customer centric and I think within marketing, we can sometimes be marketing centric. And so we're like, oh, this channel is the thing right now. But if you don't have the system set up in the way that you're executing to be getting that feedback on whether it's working or whether it's not or how it's impacting people, then it, it doesn't matter. You know, I think it's always interesting talking about particularly my background is, is in the advertising agency world. We spend a lot of time talking about what's good creative, what's bad creative. If you're on the outside of that business, you have no idea because good or bad depends on the business results that it's driving. So I think it's, it's that, it's having that feedback loop. And when you say whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing, it should be dependent on what are the business results that it's actually driving. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And um, one of the things you touched on there, the three Ps of marketing, I think, um, came up in our chat earlier and you know it's it's really about we've got a very wholesale audience today i think primarily um and as gonna said earlier you know there's um some differences in views on whether or not wholesale marketing um behaves differently um and i think i might go back to you gunner on on the sort of um classic principles um and how you see those um from a wholesale marketing perspective with this um lens of digital content so do you see it as different? Uh, different to retail, you mean? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, in the wholesale marketing space, there's always been that debate around, you know, can we learn from retail? Look at what retail is doing. Retail is so much more sophisticated than, 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 than wholesale. And I think that we need to be careful in how we, we look at that relationship. There are definitely areas where I think we can learn from retail. Uh, but there is also boundaries. Fundamentally, the products in the retail space, financial services, are much more simplistic. If you think about a highly structured derivative and how you sell and market that, you know, just can't apply the same principles as the retail. But where we do can learn, and this is, I think, uh, an important aspect, is we need to think about how we use digital tools. Um, so as an example, for instance, uh, in the retail sector, let's say again, Christoph talked about the automotive earlier. I'm going to use the same example. In the automotive sector, uh, products would have not been developed without a solid understanding of the wants and the needs and the situation in the consumer base. At least that was the case up to a point. In the wholesale uh, space, research used to be uh, consisting of consulting the usual suspects, Oliver Wyman, Greenwich Associates, uh, Orion, and the research was about uh, market share, wallet share, uh, products. Um, but it wasn't so much about understanding clients. What is on the minds of our clients? What, are, what is keeping our clients awake at night? And I think this is where digital tools can help inform a, a really smart content strategy. And that's, in my view, where we need to become smarter in using uh, uh, digital channels. 
Uh, and just a quick word on, on, on what Eric and, and Karen said earlier. I think, again, thinking about how we use digital channels, it's about combining the uh, new freedom, the new possibilities that digital offer with the personas, with people. At the end of the day, you know, we're still trying to reach, pe reach people. So understanding people, in my view, is, is one of the key things going forward in, in defining and using digital channels. Great. Kieran, I might come to you yeah. on the um, yeah. similarities. No, please do. I'm biting my, biting my tongue. Gosh, like totally <laughs> agree with everything Gunnar and Eric said. I, I just, I, digital is fantastic for giving you measurement. There are so many digital signals that everybody watching this now is literally sat on. The problem is that we don't necessarily have the, the, the time and the resources and the systems to properly use that. And, and so you end up in a situation where, you know, if we take a step back and say, well, what are we trying to do? Oh, I, I love a fishing analogy for marketing, right? What are we trying to do? We're trying to catch fish. Yeah, just catch fish. What sort of fish? You know, it bring, brings me back to what Eric was saying about that absolutely you've got the data on who all these digital entities are and what they're interested in and what they're passionate about. But I don't think, you know, it's such a big, powerful tool that we end up just sort of, you know, spraying and praying and shoving stuff out and pushing out without really having thought about, well, who is this product for? You know, and, and coming back to goodness point, like personas, oh my goodness, so neglected. You know, and I've worked in some really big companies where, you know, the personas work hasn't been done for 10, 15 years and it's out of date. You know, one one retailer I work with were actually working on persona that was 15 years out of date. And it turned out our, our audience hadn't really changed. They'd just gotten older and we hadn't realized. So, oh, my gosh, you, know, you get insights like that and suddenly your campaigns could be much, much more, more, more effective. And I think, yeah, much greater focus on the customer and matching up the customer with the right product like the customer with the right solution. Because then you can have brilliant, brilliant solutions, like really, really great customer experiences. All too often not, I, I think there's a lot of, you know, the wrong customer just being sold the, the wrong product for the wrong reasons, and they're not happy with it. And then you don't get all the magical stuff happening, like them telling all their friends and that word of mouth, which is so powerful. You know, social media feeds on that, that, that power of that word of mouth. That's why social media is so amazing. And yet we're really not capturing the opportunity there. So it's about data and capturing. Go, Eric, please. I just wanted to build on that because I, I agree with that entirely. And it just uh, sparked a thought for me. Um, uh, the, you know, I, I agree 100%. It needs to work backwards from the audience persona, who they are, the value that the product or service is providing to them. But what I found, what I think is so fascinating is I think sometimes we're not aware uh, of how much the current marketing ecosystem and philosophies are set up by a completely different era, namely one that is very TV centric. And regardless of whether you're in retail or wholesale, a lot of what we talk about and the way that we go through these exercises, particularly if we're working with you know, ad agencies and people in that space, the idea of having a persona or even like two or three personas, if you're selling to any type of market of scale in this in this day and age is kind of um it's interesting to me because there's that idea that the brand needs to stand for one thing to everybody and i'm just not sure that that's the case anymore you have the ability to create content and a brand message that is much more bespoke and tailored to different people and i think that's an opportunity that more challenger brands if i'm over generalizing challengers and incumbents um more challenger brands take advantage of, whereas a lot of incumbent organizations think about marketing more in that it needs to be this type of thing. And when we talk about digital content marketing in the post-COVID world, I think that's a tremendous opportunity to take advantage of in that space specifically. And there was, I mean, there was a Gartner report at the back end of last year that talked about um, personalization. And they actually found that a lot of marketeers were predicting that it would drop off. And so I thought this was a bit of an odd headline. So I sort of read beneath it and they said, oh, because they weren't um, measuring it. <laughs> well, if you're not measuring it, then you're not going to get the value. Um, but I think this hyper personalization piece is a really interesting um, angle. And I think it's um, really sort of pertinent to right now. Um, but it would sort of challenge back and say, wouldn't that be going further into the um, tech sort of dependent world and how important is it then to um be monitoring personas and tailoring so that you're not just doing 
you know, pop somebody's name in, insert generic message here, which I think is what's, what I've seen a lot of examples of in this sort of hyper-personalized space. It's actually, it's my name, but it's not any more personalized than that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, from my perspective real quick, you know, I think that we're in the very early days of that. And I think that good marketing has always been and will always be a balance between art and science, the human piece and the technological or more, you know, data driven piece. Uh, and it does need to be both applied at the right times in the right ways. But I think that historically, again, it's been tremendously art and creative and human driven. And there's so much opportunity on the technological and scientific side. So I think this is the area where probably most people are under invested in right now. One of the things that I'm fascinated by for the next couple of years is the rise of technology and AI in that whole space in the production of personalized creative. Because I think that that is a, you know, maybe it's not a one year thing, maybe I overestimate how much in the next year, but I think you see some of the tests that are coming out on that level just to displace very expensive, very slow, very subjective, and oftentimes ineffective creative produced by humans. Um, and so I think finding that balance of those two things put together is going to be really interesting. Governor, I'm going to come back to you on this one. Because what do you think the um, opportunities are there in the wholesale space for people to start thinking about some sort of more personalized creative? What are the things that wholesale marketers should be thinking about? Uh, it's, it's an interesting point, and we talked about this to some degree in our in our pre uh, call for this panel. Uh, one of the things that actually digital is responsible for is flooding the market with with huge amounts of volume, to the degree that the target audience do not know you know where to look, where's the right piece of information for 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 what I'm looking for, um, and so. Personalization, I think, is a key thing. Uh, we often talk about it from a, you know, the industrialization of personalization. So you've got to try and balance both elements where you find ways to package up your content uh, and make it relevant uh, to a broader audience, but still relevant to a specific persona. I think that's still, still quite key. Uh, generally speaking, I think it's a good thing that we think about that. You know, um, in my view, uh, less is more. And we need to stop. I mean, for, for us, one of the biggest challenges has been as Sogjen and not one of the you know, global bulge bracket banks. Uh, um, you know, how do we get the attention of our clients you know, just for a few seconds? Uh, and that's driven a lot of the marketing that we have defined. So um, you know, I think in that context, personalization is key. Less is more. I would like to, to, to see that we uh, start using digital in a smarter way not just to pump out more stuff and more content uh, uh, and, and flood the market. Great. And um, I'm aware there's lots of questions coming through. And there's one that I do want to go to um, straight away. I was aiming to go to questions at 20 past, but um, there's a question here come through on risk, actually, um, and how lots of people are finding that their sort of compliance teams and legal teams um, are becoming increasingly risk adverse um, and I think the suggestion is it's it's mostly around the digital communications. Um, and do the panelists have any advice on how to manage this and whether this is a wider trend um, of increasingly risk averse compliance teams um, post COVID? So any any views on that from Kieran? Can I start with you on that one? Or <laughs> oh, I, I'm always the legal department's worst nightmare when it comes to pushing <laughs> stuff out. You know, there's oh god, so many oops and things. I, I guess I don't know. I yeah, I I can't see the problem with it. If you're doing great stuff for your customers, like where where's the risk in that? You know, I, I guess I but I probably over I'm probably oversimplifying it. You know, I, I I'm I'm not working in such a tightly um restrictive uh environment. I'll so I'll probably throw that back to to either Eric or or, or Gunnar really. But that, that that's that that's the nuts and bolts of it. I think you know if you're doing great stuff for the customer. I think where, where a lot of the, the legal stuff creeps in, when you start doing stuff to your customer. No, that's not okay. That's a violation. And unfortunately, with digital tech, it's really easy to do stuff to your customers. That, you know, we've all been there. We've all been annoyed by the over-aggressive retargeting uh, of, of, a, of a product that we probably even already bought it, but the tech's not smart enough to, to know that. And so we're just bombarded with more and more messages. So I think there's a lot that marketers didn't, can do from that perspective. But I, yeah, I think if you take the view, look, we're doing great stuff for the customer. Um, you, you shouldn't go too far wrong with the uh, legislation and the legal side of it. Gunny, you're nodding. Anything to add there? 
Yeah, I think uh, regulation has become the modern marketer's worst nightmare. And, you know, again, if I think back to when I started in this industry to today, I mean, we spend endless amount of hours uh, discussing, aligning, working with uh, legal, with compliance around, you know, uh, matters such as clear, fair, not misleading, uh, uh, considering uh, the GDPR dimension. There's no doubt it's become um, more challenging. Um, all I can say, I mean, I, I kind of, it kind of depends as well. If you're more at the product marketing end of it, you're probably seeing much more interference from compliance. If you're more at the branding uh, end of it, it's probably a little bit lighter. Um, we found good ways of 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 doing things. Um, other tips, you know, work work with compliance, work with with legal, work with those functions, onboard them. Uh, we have had the experience at the beginning. You know, there is a fundamental position which is no, um, and then they start understanding and invo getting involved, and they see the they, they see that the 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 world through your eyes. And that becomes a very uh, uh, constructive uh, working relationship. So uh, it is, it, it is, it is what it is, uh, and we have to deal with it. Um, but it can, it can work if you find a good way of working with the relevant uh, colleagues. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, I mean, we've spoken a lot about personas here, um, probably more than we did on our setup call, and that makes me incredibly happy. My team, um, I only joined in July, and I think they're very bored of me talking about cohorts and personas and who's, who are you talking to? How are you talking to them? So it's it's a subject I'm um, yeah a bit overexcited about. But um, there's two questions that I want to meld, and I'm sorry if I don't do justice to either of you in melding them, but I think there's um, a sort of common theme there and it's a bit about sort of um, future gazing if you like so there's one lovely question about will digital marketing ever ex uh, replace the pleasures and experience of traditional bricks and mortar marketing and a couple of others about you know future gazing can we think about themes or predictions for 2021 um, so Eric I'm going to hit you with that one first anything that you can think of that's coming through that will um, be as pleasurable as bricks and mortar marketing. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure how to interpret that in terms of the pleasures <laughs> of bricks and mortar marketing. Um, the marketeers on this audience, you know, everybody gets lots of pleasure and pride out of their creation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think what I would say is, and Kieran was kind of touching on this in the beginning, is like, hopefully, pretty soon we stop talking about digital marketing and it just becomes marketing. I mean, you know. I think less and less we're seeing digital marketers and we're just seeing marketers who are really good at digital because you need to be good at digital to be a marketer in 2020. I'm overgeneralizing obviously, but you see my point. Uh, there used to be TV departments. There used to be TV creatives and TV media buyers. Now there's not. Um, so I think there's kind of that general evolution. In terms of predictions, the way I like to answer these questions, like I could put some stuff out there, but what I think is more interesting and helpful is it's less about predicting the future and it's more about reacting faster to the present. So that's what I think about much more because um, there's much more opportunity in just being faster and better at taking advantage of right now than there is about being trying to be right about what's coming. Very nice. I like that. Kieran, I'm coming to you. I, well, do you know what? The, the big danger here is that the digital channels, we can measure so much and bricks and mortar it's much harder to measure like there are a few things that you can start to, to to measure but i think most i mean certainly retailers that i've worked with have never really moved beyond the footfall counter which is a really blunt and brutal like stat right and and i've, I've seen this like i've seen how compelling analytics graphs and charts can be right but we mustn't get arrogant and think that we can measure everything because we can't Actually, what we end up with is too much data on the digital side and not enough everywhere else. And so we put all of our eggs in the digital basket. And I, I've seen whole industries decimated by this. I do I do believe this. Like I, I've always seen a very strong relationship between people visiting the bricks and mortar stores and the people buying stuff online. Except that my guys online, they had tracking pixels on them so I could see everything that they were doing. Um, but make no bones about it. You can't just, you know, slice the two apart you know, between the, the bricks and mortar experience and the online experience, they are they are joined because guess what? They're the same people doing it, the same people doing it. And I think we all know showrooming goes on. You know, I love to touch and feel and, and get to know products. And actually, we all know that people matter. 
like I love to know faces and uh, and people, and I think that's very much devoid. You know, you look at a you look at an online store or an online site, and if that was your branch, what would that look like? Would well, be a flipping weird branch. You'd wander in there, and there there'd just be blank walls and stuff in boxes. You know, it wouldn't be a a, a very natural or human experience. And I think we 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 we, we neglect that at our peril. Um, and we've got to stop making this weird distinction between digital and the real world because they're the same thing like your brand is it exists in both places and people interact with it um, and they feel certain stuff about real stuff that they don't feel about digital and emotion is such a powerful thing for, for for marketing so i think in in terms of the question about you know the future i think there is some technology that's going to come a close second but i don't think you'll ever beat the the whole kind of real like in the world experience we've been playing around um just with the oculus quest 2 which is a for those of you that don't know this is a 300 pound face computer right this is really cheap budget um augmented virtual reality but oh my gosh it it, it comes close like the technology is like that. if you've tried phone uh vr um and things like google cardboard and stuff forget that this is on a whole different level um, and actually, you can actually meet in virtual spaces and, and interact and stuff. And I think that's that's very exciting. Now, that might be a few years away, maybe not in the next year, but I can absolutely see a moment where our current websites look like CFAX does to us now, right? You know, because actually, you know, you've got about a thousand pages, and it's it's basically current websites. I think are high res CFAX. We've just got prettier pictures and better graphics in them. And actually, when you start to explore what's possible in virtual and augmented reality like we we've only just begun finally we might realize those dreams presented to us by marketers 20 years ago of surfing this information superhighway you know it was it was ridiculous it was nothing like that and it's still not really like that but actually i can see a day when that's coming close there are fleets of 20 somethings trying to google cfax right now yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cwfax yeah. it's all about bamboozle bamboozle was where it was at for me yeah it was all down here from that uh, I like so so great thanks for that question future gazing couple of comments uh, we talk about machines essentially and humans first of all on machines uh, for those of you connected uh, to a browser right now you can google will robots take my job uh, you enter marketing manager and you'll find that 1.4 percent chance uh, there is only 1.4 percent chance the robot will take a job why do I say that? I, th I think there's a tremendous opportunity here. Uh, what we have to do is to learn how to use digital to uh, digital tools. It's a combination of humans and machines. And I think uh, in the first few years of digital, we've started to experiment and we've discovered channels and emails and videos, and that all resulted in this you know, pumping out that volume. I think we will become smarter. And as we become smarter, the joys of traditional bricks and mortar type marketing amalgamated with digital tools is going to give us uh, opportunities that we've not dreamed uh, dreamed about you know 10 years ago so i think there's a fantastic opportunity we just have to learn how we use the uh, the tools brilliant christoph hello welcome to our session yeah, you got well, any uh, as, we, as we wrap up i would like to uh first of all congratulate you all that was a super inspiring discussion you see there's so much space for us uh, as marketers to cover and that's why i would like to just come in and uh, answer one question from one of our um senior and seasoned uh, conference att attendees katarina rabava who uh, basically asked us so sort of last year we discussed value uh, and not product as the key theme so what would be the key theme this year uh, being uh, my takeaway from your discussion here is loud and clear the key theme is relevance and uh, that's not a buzzword because relevance now in terms of uh, uh, the content but also a uh, balancing the, the very fine balance between what you know what you said the sort of industrializ uh, industrialization of personalization but then balance this with a fine point of when do you have to come in because you said less is more and i think my personal experience over this uh, this uh, this year was uh, if you have relevant content that really helps people navigating through the current crisis and stuff and you completely ditch your product and your service uh, messaging in favor of providing relevant information that sometimes has nothing to do 
with you as a bank and your products, that helps bridging that journey, that brings your attention and on the back of it, there is interest. So I think it was a fascinating discussion. So thank you very much, everyone. Amy, maybe for your uh, final uh, comments before we hand over to Jacob again. Um, just to echo, massive thanks. We could have gone on for another 20 minutes. There are more questions I should have asked you, but I didn't want to interrupt because I just think that was a great discussion. So I really appreciate your time. Um, really appreciate everyone asking questions and um, massive thanks. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Great, so we um, are waiting for Jacob to come in. There he is, Jacob. The final words of the first session of today's conference are yours. Yes, thank you very much, Christoph, and great moderating, Christoph and Amy, throughout this morning. Um, and thank you very much, Kieran. Um, so that was the, the first morning session, the first session of three. Session two starts at 12.55. So just use exactly the same GoToWebinar link as you're using uh, right now to join us again. And it's a fantastic afternoon that we've got planned for you. We've got editors from some of the world's leading publications. We have Faisal Islam from the BBC, Jason Crayon from the New York Times, James King from the FT, and Julie santorelli uh from Bloomberg. Uh, that's going to be an absolutely fascinating head-to-head uh, -head discussion. At 1.40, we have what are financial services marketers looking in their external partnerships. We've got Alison Harbert from Investec, Helen Gerabakova from CME, and Dr. Winfried Dawn from UBS. So again, an incredible panel, so don't miss that one. And at 2 o'clock, we, uh, we end the session two with Lorena Hilton from Deutsche Bank, Josh Dibbins from BlackRock, and David Weldon, former CMO of RBS. That is a fantastic lineup. So I hope I see you all at 12.55. I have to give a shout out to Andrew Carrier, who is doing our um, kind of Twitter today. So if you follow hashtag CIMFSS, you'll see he's been tweeting all the takeaways from this morning. It's fantastic. So get on Twitter. Uh, you, you now have a kind of a lunch break. So unfortunately, I can't provide the lunch, but enjoy your lunch catch up with uh, the, the content on Twitter, share your thoughts with the audience. Sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. It's been fantastic that you've been sharing questions all the way along. But um, for now, I will say uh, see you soon at 12.55. Thank you. So uh, the, the first session that we're going to start with this afternoon will be the editor's view. We've got a fantastic panel um, about to join us. Um, but before we get to the panel, I'd just like to ask um, Alex Delamain, the, the president of the World Media Group and uh, the main person at The Economist, to join, uh, join me here on stage just to say a few words about the World Media Group. Alex, I don't know if you're able to turn on your uh, your video camera. Right? Can you hear? Fantastic. Yeah, yes, that's perfect. I was I couldn't unmute myself. I didn't know. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, uh, Jacob. And um, good afternoon to everyone. So, um, as Jacob said, I'm. Um, Alex Delamain, I'm the World Media Group President and Global Client Partner at The Economist. Um, many of you know who we are and what we do, but for those that don't, I just want to take a few moments to bring to life our mission and purpose, if I may. So the World Media Group is an industry body which promotes the values of quality and trusted journalism to the marketing and advertising community. Uh, 2020 has been a challenging and unusual year, to put it mildly, and our member brands have played a vital role in helping us all make sense of the uncertainty, informing us on key global issues such as the US elections, the pandemic, of course, and the ongoing Brexit discussions. Misinformation is rife on social platforms, as we know, and through less trusted news sources. So our voice and filter on world affairs has never been more vital. Our member brands have helped influence opinions, challenged the status quo and informed the world with rigor and accuracy 
building a unique bond of trust with the world's most highly engaged and influential audiences. A world without this editorial integrity is a, a rather scary one, I hope you'll agree. So I'm really excited about this next session as we'll have the privilege of hearing directly from four of our leading financial editors. It will be a rich discussion read by Francesco Guerrera, head of international at Barron's Group, who you heard from earlier today in conversation with Christoph and Amy. So without further ado, I thank you again for joining us, Francesco, and, uh, and pass over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alex and Jacob. Um, it is my privilege to share this panel and I would like to um, ask the panelists to join me uh, on stage. I'll introduce them briefly. Uh, you really, really, they need no introduction, but it's, uh, uh, we, we have uh, Faisal Islam, who is the economics editor at BBC News, uh, Jason Karayan, editor of Deal Book at the New York Times, James King, global channel editor at the Financial Times and editor of Tech Scroll Asia newsletter, and Julie santorello Carell, senior analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence covering the fintechs and payment sectors. Uh, so welcome. Um, over the next 40 minutes, we'll discuss a lot of topics, but a reminder that the audience can ask questions. Uh, if you just type them in, I'll see them and I'll be able to relay them to, uh, to, to the panel. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully Julie will join us soon as well. Um, let's start, uh, just let's start with the news, right? Because the biggest news arguably today is the fact that the UK became the first Western country to approve uh, a, a COVID vaccine. And I would love to hear from Faisal, who has been covering this up until now, his perspective on this, what he thinks this is going to do to, to the economy, both in the UK and globally, uh, in the short and medium term, and uh, how quickly we'll see some changes. Sure. Thanks, Francesco. Yes, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, with some humility as an economist rather than an epidemiologist, I do note that the Bank of England and the IMF have been employing epidemiologists to try to predict where the economy is going. So we've all had to follow them, uh, and in my defence, I come from a very medical family who've given me sharp insight into what it's like on the on the on the, on the front line uh, with with uh, with all the efforts going into fight this. Um, and clearly, the economics, as you all know, as finance directors, totally conditioned by the epidemiology um, of this. Uh, and I think it's just worth uh, standing back, uh, standing back a little bit on the announcement of the approval this morning for uh, use and rollout uh, of a vaccine in the UK. We have never had an approved human vaccine, not just for COVID, but for any coronavirus ever, right? So this has happened far more quickly than we would have expected. A great scientific achievement, mainly for the developers, but also the regulators in fast tracking. And, um, and secondly, we have never had a vaccine emerge in the middle of a pandemic before. So the potential economic impact based on any precedent is uh you know would be pretty large that it that it would occur in the middle of the pandemic within a year of a pandemic and be effective it is potentially you know absolutely uh stratospheric the sort of impact you could have um uh, from uh, a vaccine in particular as you all know because the impact comes through a kind of twin track here you have the impact of uh the direct uh well, th well th there's, there's three ways, of course, the economy's been impacted by the pandemic. The direct health impact, sort of just directly taking people out, uh, either through illness or through uh, fatality. You have um, the impact of mandatory lockdowns decided by government, which is also very, very large. And then you have this really important part of the piece, which is the voluntary social distancing, which in some economies has been bigger in economic impact than what's been mandated. So that, that third part of the puzzle is really important. Um, now, the way I, I've just written a blog on this at BBC website, the way I, and I don't need to tell any of the audience this, but the way this could filter into the economy through the expectations of finance directors currently sitting down to set their budgets for fiscal 21-22, facing extreme caution. Now, some of you out there have got, uh, not take a punt, but can actually think, well, things aren't going to go back to normal, but it's more likely to be more normal than abnormal by the end of next year. And do we want to be positioned for that? I think that's transformative for the economy. Uh, it stops a very negative spiral of expecting things to be worse and therefore planning for them to be worse and therefore having fewer jobs and fewer investments and that becoming to some degree self-fulfilling. It inoculates us to some degree against that. 
It means, though, two areas of caution. I think that, that you could go both ways over the next three months. I think that there's a logic to where the UK government have been suggesting, which is if we have light at the end of the tunnel, therefore you would be more cautious than you otherwise would be over the next three months. And that also applies to sort of voluntary distancing too. People might uh, be a little bit cautious over the next three months, but obviously I don't need to tell you great news. We are now su subject to any scientific bad news, uh, which would hit the downside, especially to asset values, house prices and stock markets but good news, good scientific news, and kind of revelatory in terms of its historic medical precedent. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, if we go around the world for a second, I'd like to come to James now, because uh, I wonder whether the impacts are, are similar, you, you foresee the impacts of this being similar in, in China in particular, and, and in Asia in general, uh, and uh, hi, Julie, welcome. And, um, and whether you think that there are, um, implications for the geopolitical tensions that we've been seeing between particularly China and the US. Thanks very much, Francesco. It's great to be here. Um, I think I'm sitting here in Hong Kong, and obviously I think everybody knows that China has made um, uh, great strides since the virus originated there in uh, really kind of locking down the country and keeping the virus, you know, pretty much at bay. Um, so what we've seen here, and, and I think this uh, goes to the geopolitical question that you are asked, is that the Chinese economy is roaring back. Uh, it is recovering first. Um, I mean, of course, there are economies like Taiwan that have also done an incredible job in uh, preventing the virus's spread, and they haven't been hit very badly at all, even throughout the whole course of this. But uh, in terms of major economies, we're seeing the Chinese economy roaring back now it looks as if uh gdp growth may be getting back up to you know six seven percent towards the end of the year and probably will continue to do that next year may even go higher than that so what we're what we're seeing geopolitically is that china was blamed very strongly at the beginning of this by the us and by european countries and lost a lot of kudos in terms of its international image and particularly because of the way that it then fought back. There was the so-called wolf warrior diplomat uh, uh, phenomenon where Chinese diplomats had a very robust response to the rest of the world, and that didn't win them any friends either. But now we're in a potentially a new phase as vaccines come out. And don't forget, there are four vaccine companies in China, and hundreds of thousands of Chinese have already taken these vaccines even though they're still in phase three testing. Um, and so far, I spoke to the um, to a senior executive in one of these companies, and I asked, you know, have there been any adverse effects from the vaccines that you've been administering? And I was told that the whole board of this company had taken the vaccine and none of them had died yet. Uh, this was, I suppose, black humor. <laughs> A sense. Um, so it's not only Pfizer that's coming up with a vaccine. I fully expect these Chinese vaccines to be, well, I mean, they already are being rolled out very quickly in China and possibly elsewhere. Indonesia has already signed on to get Chinese vaccines. So it's an interesting situation. I think we're geopolitically, we're moving into phase two of this whole thing, which is potentially that China may be able to win back some of the, the kudos it lost um, during the early phase. Quick follow up on that before I, I, we go to the others. But, so do you expect or do, are you already seeing a more conciliatory approach by China, given what you just said to the, to the West? It's, uh, it's not rhetorically conciliatory. And uh, you will have seen, Francesco, the very harsh criticism of, of Australia that China is currently engaging in. I think this has an impact far beyond the countries that China targets. Um, you know, I think a lot of countries look at the way China is criticizing Australia, spreading all kinds of, uh, um, you know, incriminating um, uh, statements about Australia, and other countries around the world think, wow, that could be me, that could be us next. So um, I, I, I don't think rhetorically China is being more conciliatory, 
but in terms of delivering vaccines, in terms of helping with the debt problems of countries in Africa uh, and other um, countries along the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, China can take some steps that I think can, can help to kind of ameliorate the huge hemorrhage it suffered in terms of its international image. Got it. So, um, thank you, James. Uh, Jason, um, by all means, talk about a, a vaccine and COVID if you want, but I was going to ask you a little more about the other big piece of news that we've had in the last few weeks, which is the, the, the US election and how this affects uh, business and policy and how do you see it now that uh, the new administration is filling in some of the key key roles? I mean, what's your perspective on that? Right. Thanks a lot for having me. And just to, to key off of what of what James just said there, I think interestingly, um, Joe Biden did an interview with uh, the New York Times, uh, one of my colleagues yesterday, and uh, you know he said that the tariffs on China will not come off immediately. He used kind of a variation of of America First, which is obviously Donald Trump's sort of um, signature policy branding, but for Biden it means more investment in in R and D into things like AI, clean energy, um, possibly an actual infrastructure bill at some point. Um, and so that's kind of interesting. And so that's something that we've been trying to get our heads around at the moment. Like what, let's say, America first means for a Biden administration. And it's clearly not exactly the same as um, as Trump. But there are there are traces of it. There are there are undertones of that with um, a kind of an anti-globalization ish stance with Biden. And then more broadly, as far as business goes, I think what will mark the entire Biden era, however long it lasts, is this push and pull between, uh, I mean, capitalism and socialism, if we want to go very, very broad on it. He's being pulled from the left wing of his party um, to not nominate, you know, any uh, important people that have any sorts of Wall Street or corporate ties. And he's also being pilloried by the right and conservatives um, for, you know, a socialist takeover. And that's a pretty tricky balance to strike at the moment. He seems to be more or less trying to roll out kind of an Obama Clinton 2.0 type um, administration. And, and, you know, like, like Janet Yellen seems, seems quite um, well liked on, on, on all sides and other figures like that. But more and more with his economic team, I think we'll see more, let's say, contentious nominees who could potentially, you know, not find confirmation if the Republicans keep the Senate or from within the Democratic Party might not be seen as uh, progressive enough, if you want to put it that that way. And that's the the tricky balance that Biden is trying to strike now. What's not at all clear and we're, you know, re reporting it out is like who in a Biden administration businesses can can call on can what's the way in? He seems unlikely to tap, you know, full Wall Street types for official roles, especially the 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 highest ones. And so there's um, you know a bit of a scramble at at the moment to figure out how you know a big bank or a big company can lobby this incoming administration and and who they talk to. Um, it's also a much differently run group, which you can already see, you know, in terms of messaging discipline, I think we'll get a lot fewer leaks than under the Trump administration, but but maybe a bit more coherence in the message, let's say, in terms of everyone going in the same direction. And, and that also, in some ways, makes it easier to, for businesses to get their head around the new administration, in other ways, might make it harder to sort of find people that can um, bend their ear. Yeah, it's a good topic, actually. I would like to devote some part of this conversation to your craft and how it's changing. So I want to ask you, Jason, about how this is going to change and the, the new administration, because you, you had an interesting time as journalist during the previous uh, administration. Um, Julie, um, welcome. And uh, you you had the, I guess, the, the privilege of, of covering one of the most, uh, the hottest sectors uh, in, in, in financial markets at the moment, which, if anything, got even hotter during the pandemic. So FinTech, digital payments, everybody's forgotten about cash. So. What, what do you expect for 2021 in light of recent events and, and, and where do you see kind of the, the winners and losers, if you like, among companies? 
Yeah, so um, so one of the, the sort of themes that we're that we're looking at for 2021 is around this battle for banking. You know, it seems that so many different kinds of non-banks, right, are beginning to offer or continuing to offer banking services um, and adding more and more types of services, um, mainly to their apps. Um, and so we 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 think that it's you know, the competition is going to heat up. We'll see a lot more of it, a lot more kinds of banking services rolling out from non-banks, and then we'll see what the traditional banks are going to do um, to respond. Um, so since the pandemic, we have seen some um, important changes, you know, that really are showing a shift to banking to into to non-traditional um, sectors. Um, the increase in debit um, is one of those. When you think about um, the wallet providers, uh, the challenger banks, they're all offering debit cards, right? It's no coincidence that the increase in, in, in debit is happening as people are looking at more and more ways um, to pay digitally as they're performing more commerce online um, and therefore naturally paying uh, digitally. Um, and that's, dry, that's one of the, the big shifts that we're seeing. Um, but what we're going to be watching in 2021 are really kind of the, the, the ways this dynamic unfolds among four big non-bank, let's say, groups. Um, the first are the challenger banks. Um, so, you know, it's, it's TransferWise and, um, um, and, um, and Monzo and Revolut and N26 in Europe, um, Chime, Vero, which has got a banking license in the U.S., um, SoFi. Um, so we're looking at those companies, and when, when we in, in the UK, they are quite uh, the challenger banks are, are pretty far along, um, pretty close to, to being comparable to the traditional banks when it comes to mobile app users. Um, so they've made a lot of strides. Um, this, the products are relatively simple, but they're adding to them. And when they start adding things like lending, right? They already have debit cards, they have a basic account, um, it's all online. When they start adding things like lending, you know, they're they're really kind of beginning to chip away at that core important part of traditional banking. Um, and, the, and the progress has been quite um, quite strong really since I was in the pandemic came out for several of the companies, you can really see the curve, you know, just just going um, going straight up. Um, you don't see so much of an increase um, in mobile users for the traditional banks, um, you know, really since March, April. Uh, the other group that we're looking at, um, which is, which is um, one that we're most excited about are the wallet providers, um, PayPal, um, Squares, Cash App, right? And then you have the hardware-based ones, Apple Pay, Google Pay, Samsung Pay. They're all now getting more and more into banking services. Um, so they started with sort of a free service, you know, peer-to-peer -peer payments. Um, but as that helps suck in users, um, they are now beginning to try to monetize that user base. Um, they're doing it with debit cards and now credit cards. Um, they're beginning to offer bill pay. We'll see more of that rolling out next year. They're starting to do direct deposit. Um, they started with stimulus checks, um, tax refunds, um, and that kind of got that business going. And now it's moving into payroll. If, if a user starts to use direct, -to -pay, direct deposit of their payroll into their wallet, that starts to become a primary account, right? Um, and that gets a little concerning, um, obviously, for, uh, for the banks. You know, PayPal has 330 million active users, right? That's a big base um, to tap into. Um, Venmo, um, Cash App are, you know, between 30 and 40 million. Still pretty big um, and bigger than what any of the, the banks or challenger banks have in terms of mobile app users. Um, the third group we're looking at are the, are the new lenders. Um, the new lenders, you know, some of these alternative lenders haven't done that well. They've struggled a bit to, to, um, to really make, uh, make big inroads in terms of growth and profitability. But one area that's really interesting, and I'm, I'm sure you've been hearing more and more about it, is buy now, pay later. Um, Afterpay, Klarna, um, now a firm is going public in the U.S. Um, really you know, getting to triple digit kinds of growth levels um, this year. And that is tied to what I was mentioning earlier, which are debit cards. Right. People are using debit cards more um, that, you know, sometimes it's for budgeting reasons. Sometimes it's because they're just buying basic goods these days um, um, and they tend to use debit cards. And also because I was talking about so many new issuers of debit cards from challenger banks to wallets and so on. Um, but the way to make things more affordable on a debit card is with buy now, pay later. Right. Um, it no longer has to be just the cash that's in your account now. Now you can stretch it out over several installments, makes it much easier. 
Um, and it's really kind of taken off along with that rise in debit. Um, and we know, you know millennials, Gen Zs um, really love this kind of way to pay. It's they, they don't trust credit cards. They don't so much trust big banks. Um, so this really sort of played into um, what they can do. Um, and the companies have managed quite well considering um, now in terms of their charge off rates. Um, we'll see how that how that holds up as the as the pandemic continues. So we're watching that group really carefully. And then of course big tech, right? Um, Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon. Right now they are starting to to get into banking. Um, some of the company, you know, Amazon, I think is more about about Amazon, right? And improving um, their model, um, not so much about competing with the big banks. Um, but you have um, Google just rolled out Plex with checking accounts and savings accounts. We're sure they're going to be doing more there. Um, we expect Apple um, to follow as well. They already have the Apple Card. You know, we think other things are going to begin to come more into their wallet, new services like bill pay, um, maybe debit cards, um, uh, advising, lending, investing, um, you know, so many, so many areas like that. The interesting thing is that big tech seems to be more inclined to partner with the big banks. Um, and this could be a nice way for the big banks to catch up digitally, right, to reach a younger audience um, and to be able to really harness the power of big data, which big tech is so good at. Right to be able to do to be do a better job at risk assessment, at personalization, and reaching customers. Um, so that I think that the tech company involvement actually could be a positive for banks, um, and we should start seeing more and more partnerships. We think um, as the uh, as the year unfolds next year. Thank you, Jimmy. A chill went down my spine when you said the harnessing the power of big data for finance as well. As well, big tech is going to go up. Uh, loaded, so, loaded proposition for sure. Indeed, indeed. Um, just a quick question, just to go back to Faisal. There is a question, a good question, I think, for the audience in relation to the vaccine, which is how do you think governments, the question is about the UK in particular, will address the, the trust issue? When you look at some of some, some uh, polls, you see that not everybody wants to be vaccinated. And it mm -hmm. depends on the country. So how do you think governments go, will go about trying to persuade people to, uh, to get the vaccine? So... Um, I think they're aware that in this current kind of political social media age where authority is atomized all over the place, you need to be transparent and credible, particularly when self-evidently this has happened more quickly than would be the typical timeline for vaccines. So they've been quite upfront about that. I see the Department of Health have already started even yesterday sort of tweeting out social media videos explaining why and how this has happened within a year rather than typically Five or, six, uh, five or six years, as you would expect. Um, but the numbers are pretty stark. I think 36%, according to, um, I forget which institute it was, uh, they polled it, although there was an academic paper that came out over the summer, showing 36% in the UK were either um, uncertain or unlikely to want to take a vaccine. And if you look at the rates of population, so-called herd immunity that would be required to make it effective, you need 70, 80% people to take it. So if that was taken at face value, uh, that would be a problem. So I think they're well aware of it. Probably the way to do it is just let the experts take, you know, try and take the, 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 the big, you know, front of house presentations of it all, rely on medics and doctors. Um, and they'll also be, you know, relying on a kind of, sort of social factor here. What seems like a sort of scientific experiment when suddenly your doctor, doctors, nurses, social care workers, people you care about who are vulnerable, when they all start taking it, it suddenly starts to become quite normal. Uh, there's, there's that other separate thing which is extremely interesting, which is the extent to which it is mandated for various activities. And you know, it's, it's not a government that wants to say that, um, but there will be decisions foisted upon them on things like travel, not even made by the UK government, maybe been made by other governments. Vaccination passports are normal, right? Just that most people don't normally encounter them. Suddenly it will become potentially a very real thing, extraordinary thing um, um, in your passports if you wanna to go to a relatively ordinary holiday, um, but that's a clear benefit. So I think that they are well aware of the behavioral finance around this and uh, they'll be using big data. We just heard about big data there. They'll be using big data too, I think. Um, and, and they'll be fighting a battle, frankly, on social media to uh, that is best won by transparency experts and not seeming, not trying to make this 
kind of big politics. I think, can, can I just jump in? I think this 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 presents an interesting challenge for businesses too, because there's some executives that that we've been speaking with that 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 idea of like a of like a vaccination passport and it and it, and it goes it dovetails with like testing too you might need that to go into the office potentially there's some privacy issues with that obviously but but that the pressure there to get vaccinated or tested before that or to prove somehow that that you are immune to the extent that we know is something that I know also, you know, boardrooms are dealing with because they're trying to figure out who they let into the office and who they don't, trying to also take all the privacy implications into account. And so I think that's another angle to all that. Yeah, and there I say it's a, it's a responsibility for the press as well, because you guys, we will have to kind of convey the the the, the message that it is actually safe and and and. Uh, encourage people to uh, to vaccinate right or at least uh try to do so but we'll talk about that in a second jason i'm going to stay with you i want to ask an economics question right there's a lot of parallels being drawn by um the media in between the the time uh biden was last in the white house uh with with obama and this time uh that was of course after the financial crisis uh the economy then was much much worse right? so Biden is actually inheriting a better economy than he did then right how do you see the, the trajectory? What, what do you think the administration will end up doing, um, especially because we have buoyant and financial markets as well? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 another crisis administration, let's say. So so yeah, things are things are bouncing back up when they join, as opposed to to teetering down. But you know, digging out of a of a huge hole, as 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 we all know. And I think that's to a certain degree that does seem to inform some of his cabinet picks that these are people who are very well versed in in the past crisis who were often in the white house or or in key agencies um uh doing that and clearly the kind of mood music from the administration is that they learned then that you need to go you know big early and i think to a certain extent you know under jay powell and 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 even the 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 cares act the original stimulus act in the us in march that that has already happened, although it does seem like probably most people think that another stimulus is needed, but definitely bogged down in in partisan gridlock there. So I think there's definitely a, let's say, more, I don't know, aggressive approach to stimulus, to, you know, bailouts, if you want to call it that, coming in. Um, but it's it's hard to see at the moment how... Biden could potentially get past the hyper partisanship in the US which is you know always always been there but clearly is 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 becoming more um sticky let's say and 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 that seems unclear and we won't know who who really controls the senate until January um and 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 so that that kind of clouds the picture but i can imagine from an agency from a regu from a regulatory perspective um, especially with people like Yellen at the Treasury, we will see a lot of action to the extent that Biden can use executive orders, can can impose rules, can shift enforcement um, of various actions. That 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 will be the first act of stimulus. But they are pushing very hard even before they they take office for some sort of of, of new stimulus package which may or may not happen um congress is not really in session for all that long um until the uh holiday break uh so we'll see and even if there is something it will probably won't be as much as the democrats want so i would still expect a pretty um frenzied uh period of executive orders and 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 regulation and that sort of thing that that you could control from the executive interesting are you what's your are you optimistic or pessimistic on the on the stimulus package being approved uh, right it's this you know th there's this there's this kind of bar bipartisan group that came out this week basically splitting the difference between republican and democratic leaders who who seem pretty dug in um around 900 billion dollars is their is their package i it it everything i hear is that that's not going to go anywhere and I think everyone is kind of dug in ahead of these Georgia Senate runoffs, which is, right. you know, the, the whole, the whole, the, the 
debate about stimulus and the prospects for it run through Georgia, basically. It's not something you would have expected this time last year, but that's what we're looking at now. And, and, and you know, it's like, ask me again in a month and, and we might have a better idea. Got it. James, a it's a more. slightly different question on, on but picking up on what you were saying before, uh, in other, other periods of massive dislocation, the most recent probably after the financial crisis, China took advantage of the fact that it was in better shape than the West to, to gain financial, economic, and political ground over the West. I mean, do you see this happening now, given what you were saying before about the economy and the, the way they responded to the virus? Are they emboldened? Are they willing to go forward? Yes. Um, um, yeah, com com coming back, actually, before I, I get to that, uh, to, to what Jason was saying, it's interesting um, that you mentioned that Biden is, is, is not keen to you know, lift the tariffs that, that the US imposed on, uh, on Chinese exports. From this perspective over here, the question is sort of, well, we can understand that he might not want to do that immediately, but it, the question is sort of, why not? Because it looks from this perspective as, as if the US has lost uh, the trade war. Uh, the Chinese trade surplus has been shooting up. Um, it won't quite be a record in 2020, but it won't really be that far off. And the last few months, we've seen it growing very sharply indeed. So it doesn't appear as if the US has managed to impose a great deal of pain on the Chinese economy through this trade war um, um, policy. The, the, the pain has been there, but it hasn't come through tariffs. It's come through direct actions on Chinese companies like Huawei and many others. I mean, there's, there's more than 150 uh, Chinese companies on the US entity list, um, you know, being sanctioned in various different ways. That has been painful, um, particularly for those individual companies. But, you know, um, when it comes to sort of outstanding geopolitical questions, and one of the, the things that, that from here, it looks as if should be in Biden's inbox on day one, um, that might be it. And some of the others are, you know, obvious, obviously, should the US rejoin some of its uh, you know, some of the big trading agreements, uh, what used to be called the TPP, now is the CTPPP, I, I believe, rather a lot of acronyms there. Um, China's just joined its own trading block called RCEP, um, which, you know, is, is composed of a lot of countries in this region, not just Asia, but also um, so-called Pacific countries as well. So I think there is quite a lot for a Biden administration to kind of get its head around because it looks to me at least and to several others over here as if this is, this is not going in the US's interests. Um, when it comes to the, to the economy, Francesco, uh, as you mentioned, I think what's interesting is that we're not seeing a repeat of 2009. Um, you, I, you will remember that time. I remember your reporting from that time. 2008, the global financial crisis comes along. China was the first to stimulate its way out of that. And we saw Chinese growth go from the doldrums at the end of 2008. And let's not forget, they lost 30 million jobs in two months. Um, and then they unleashed the biggest stimulus package the world has ever seen. And so we had growth going over eight, nine percent in 2009, 2010. This time we are not going to see that. And the reason is very obvious. Chinese debt load is huge and Chinese property prices are very high. So China does not have the ability now, either in terms of adding to its debt load or in terms of creating another liquidity bubble that would push property prices even further out of reach of Chinese households um, to unleash another stimulus. So I think what we're gonna see, Francesco, is just you know, fairly robust growth around current levels, five, six percent, maybe next year getting to seven percent. A lot of it depends on what happens in the rest of the world. Thank you, Jen. And also thank you for re remembering my reporting in the financial crisis. That makes <laughs> two of us. Um, so, Julie, um, if China is not a bubble, I have to ask whether your sector is a bit bubbly, right? There's a lot of high valuations in there and uh, a lot of what you would normally call speculation. How do you feel and what do you advise investors to do to navigate what is, can be a rich sector, but it also be bubbly? 
Yeah, um, yeah valuations for sure um, have uh, have gone through the roof. Um, Square, PayPal, um, you know, multi- tens and tens of multiples of, of what they've traded at historically. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, what, with the way we think it's it's going to play out, um, you know, through this sort of pandemic time, right? As, as things are, are beginning to, you know, as people are going to read the writing on the wall of how bad it was going to be, um, <clears throat> everything sold off. And you begin to sort out um, who the winners and losers might be during this sort of um, pandemic period. Um, and, and a lot of people latched on to this digital payments opportunity. Um, and so there's a few games in town and everyone loads up and, 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 you know, and the stocks um, get really expensive. Um, so the question is, what are investors looking at now? Right. What are what are investors seeing um, for 2021? Um, who are the winners and losers they're going to be? And if we are, you know, we have this vaccine, the general thinking is that by the middle of 2021, a majority of people will have the vaccine available and, and be vaccinated. And by the second half of 2021, the economy starts to look more normal. And so um, the investment community is going to be looking at who's who's going to come back right who, who comes back um in that scenario and it tends to be the more beaten up stocks the cyclical stocks um that are going to recover and so we expect at some point um earlier in in the year we'll see this rotation from and we start to see some of it already um in, in tech broadly right um some some sell-off and so we think that that's going to continue um probably will put some pressure on some of on, on many of these stocks with you know especially the, the highest flyers doesn't mean they're going to come crashing back down to where they were pre-pandemic um but we'll probably see some correction um but i don't think the fundamentals are going to change <clears throat> and that's the most important part so that's what you know you want to look out for those periods where there is that correction there's a rotation back to cyclicals these stocks start to look less stellar they come down a little bit and we call that a buying opportunity right um so it you know we can't necessarily time the market we can't pick it perfectly but we can watch the fundamentals and we can watch the strategies and and the news and and what these companies are rolling out and we expect that to be all positive and and we would take the weakness as a buying opportunity thank you uh, we have a few uh, minutes remaining, so I would like, if possible, to take the, the audience, for you guys to take the audience inside your working lives. I think it's, it'd be very interesting for financial marketeers to hear from top journalists about how this period, this unusual, extraordinary period, has changed your working lives uh, and your, uh, if you like, the, the, the stakes you're playing with as journalists, right? Um, maybe I'll start with you, Faisal, because uh, you report for, for the BBC, and, and so the, the demands and challenges of reporting for the BBC are different, perhaps, of other news organizations. How has it changed? Has, has it made it even more paramount that you are, uh, uh, or, or has, it, has it made it, has it increased the level of responsibility, if you like, uh, or, or think, someone like you? Yeah, I think so, hugely. But um, to link into the question that you posed earlier about, about vaccines and the extent to which we should be supportive or not, and all that sort of stuff, you know, there is a, there are, you know, there's a mode of journalism which is kind of aggressive accountability journalism. Um, and that's vital and important um, where, where we see lies, exaggerations and untruths to kind of uh, report robustly. Um, there is a sort of public information aspects to some of what the Beeb does, uh, particularly in the middle of a crisis. And, and that never weighed with me more um, in my sphere, uh, which is economic, than when you know that the government is cooking up uh, extraordinary fiscal intervention to pay the wages well it's extraordinary for the UK not so much for Germany France and Spain but extraordinary intervention to pay the wages of millions of workers which is frankly uh, unbelievable from the UK perspective even in February that that would have happened um, and so you're then faced with a whole welter of speculation about that and I think for me and at the time we were getting 15 million audiences, including probably like a million or two business owners. You know, when you've got a mass audience, a small fraction of that is still a lot of people. And, and they're wondering what on earth is going on. They don't understand this new, no one understands this new virus. And they certainly don't expect the government at that point to step in and pay 80% of wages. It's like literally unbelievable. So to communicate that as it's evolving, uh, and, and, you know, I remember this one point where it looked as if it was going to get taken away. And I had people on the phone from, you know, high up in business organisations saying, you know, if you even hint in this direction in your short live with Hugh Edwards, 
that it's going to get taken away when we don't think it is going to get taken away you know there are hundreds of thousands of people who might actually get fired i think that was maybe a bit of an exaggeration but for example getting the bank of england governor to say very clearly in a way that central bank governors do not normally say just say straight up what are you saying to business owners who have their hand hovering over a mouse or the trackpad as it probably would be now ready ready to fire people because of the spreadsheets that say they've got no cash left and he just said wait hold on things that you would never expect are about to happen and you might just find you'd be able to keep those people on more than you would expect and so to be able to communicate that as well as hold the government to account on their performance at the beginning of the pandemic you know uh, strongly um matters last thing i say is this that last bit that accountability stuff is really important for our credibility to communicate the more information stuff so if we were soft on stories about medical testing or you know the vaccine then you know our credibility is really important it's important that we're seen to be strong and tough and ask difficult questions of government and i think that i think those in government are you know realize that too there's no point just having people reading out press releases it's no good for anybody makes sense jason what's your perspective on this i i i suggest something but feel free to disagree with me i also work for a us-based company and Sometimes I found that during this pandemic, the connectivity was a bit frayed, right? It was a bit difficult to communicate. And, you know, I couldn't just fly to New York as I would have done perhaps in the past. I don't know if you experienced the same thing or, or what's your perspective on that? Yeah, for sure. Going, going remote is, um, has, been, has been tricky for big uh, media organizations that, you know, rely a lot on, on newsrooms and those kind of informal net, networks and that sort of thing. But, that, you know, that's not totally unusual for any any big company but when it comes to you know quickly and and like Faisal said you know accurately and responsibly reporting um and writing that can be a little bit a little bit tricky i think one thing that i that i've seen change that's been that's been kind of interesting um is you know i mean there are news wires out there obviously there's there's a there's a bunch in your in your company but th these stories the election the virus everything that's happened this this year has become kind of it's it's lent itself to more like live journalism even for a newspaper like i work for so we're running all these constantly updated briefings you know three four five seven a day on 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 certain topics and you know one of the most uh, popular, let's say, and that's and that's a good thing, I think, to come back to accountability journalism is that we launched something called the Daily Distortions, and so we have a, a running blog basically that tracks uh, viral misinformation, and a lot of that has been related to the election in the U.S. recently. But there's a lot, there's plenty of vaccine misinformation out there too, and taking that head on with in in this in this style and this and this and this fast up updating style where all the headlines are basically no comma this isn't what they say it is you know and, and then and then we explain why that is those have been you know encouragingly incredibly popular as far as the traffic goes because i think in our information um ecosystem if you want to put it that way there's a lot of pollution out there and so and so cutting through it in that way has been interesting and then just as far as the craft goes i think there's a real shift especially at, at 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 perhaps older outlets like the one i work for now to get more in that mode of updating things quick you know putting things up quickly and then filling them out having a lots of different formats and not just the you know 1500 word story that comes out in print the next day and all that kind of thing so that's you know not necessarily unusual for as far as digital media goes but but it's it's been you know a fairly major revolution um inside these walls at least virtual walls yeah uh, very interesting james um i mean you are by far one of the greatest journalists i've ever worked with so i want to ask you this question because i've seen you in action i, don't, I haven't worked with the others so i don't i don't i don't think it's <laughs> um but i'm looking forward to working with all the others um <laughs> the um well, how has this affected your sourcing i mean you can't, well, at least here in, in, in Europe, you can't go out with sources anymore. Uh, it's very complicated. And to get a story out of someone on Zoom is really tough, at least personally. I mean, well, how, how have you? Yeah, you're, you're, you're so right. Uh, you're, well, you're not right about me being a great journalist, but you are right about the, uh, the point you made. Um, uh, it, it's basically, it, it's, it's, it's disastrous for 
journalism that, that, that relies on sources. So investigative journalism, which is a big part of what the Financial Times is, is doing in Hong Kong and what I'm supposed to be doing, uh, you not only miss the face-to-face -face contact, the kind of whispers over lunch, but you also miss that vital aspect, which is the serendipity of a natural conversation. So you're having a natural conversation with, with somebody and they let something slip maybe that they didn't intend to or just sort of popped into their head. That type of interaction, which is so vital for journalists, just doesn't happen in this type of format. And then the other thing I, I'm, I'm sure everybody's experienced is a lot of, uh, of webinars and Zoom conferences and, and things like that, which, which are great. I mean, you know, they, they, they really are our lifeline these days. But the problem is that you don't get people's name cards <laughs> if you're just meeting them on Zoom. And therefore, it's really tough to build up a relationship with people that you first met. So I really uh, sympathize with uh, younger journalists who are just starting out. This has been a terrifically difficult time for people who don't have pre-existing sources. Yeah, and I completely agree. Julie, last word to you and a similar question, perhaps related to clients. So how do you interact with clients now that you can meet them by lunch? Yeah, yeah, it, it's tough. I mean, analysts spend so much time on the road. And, and on, on one hand, meeting with company management teams, right, CEOs, CFOs, and you, you know, not meeting in person, you sort of you miss the body language, right? The words can be really um, can be really really clear and uh, and um, and and direct and all buttoned up, but the body language can tell you something else. So we miss that. And then the other time we spend on the road is meeting clients. Um, and sharing with them our ideas and you know, having that, that give and take and, and we just can't do it. Um, so we've decided that we need to do more webinars. I mean, great you know, revelation. I know everyone's doing it, right? And so um, early on in the pandemic, it was, it was great. And when we were doing webinars, um, traffic was huge. Um, we had a, a lot of people um, around. As the months have gone on, everyone's been doing webinars. Everyone's a little webinared out. Um, and so it's hard to keep people's attention. Um, we don't really have a better way yet, right? And things are getting even, even you know, tighter once again. Um, so I think you know what we what we what we are trying to do now is make the webinars more more interesting. Um, have them be more thematic, um, so people are coming for answers to a very specific pressing question um, and pulling in more experts, sometimes company management teams, um, sometimes outside experts, um, but to just try to bring to our clients um, people who they may could have, you know, they probably could not have heard from um, otherwise. Um, it, it's done well, but it, it's getting more competitive and we're, you know, we're competing, competing for every user now on those webinars. What we call, what we would call must have content, right? That stuff that people come to uh, because they have to. Um, unfortunately, exactly. we're, sorry. I'm um, sorry, that's all we have time for, but uh, I would like to thank the panel uh, and I'm sure the audience, if we were doing it live, would uh, give you a round of applause because it's such a great, uh, it's such a great panel. So thank you very much, Faisal, Jason, James, and Julie. And back to Crystal. Francesco and uh, panel, before you go away, and thank you very much. This was an absolute inspiring uh, discussion. I'd like to ask a last question to you because the big topic about ESG hasn't been addressed and in terms of what your view is, whether this trend towards ESG will change the economic situation positively, because we've all experienced that we do not have to travel so much on business. And I appreciate all your comments made because of you know the lack of, of personal interactions, absolutely correct. But I don't think we're going to go back into the 100% world of business travel and stuff. So what are your personal experiences and views as to the economic impact of this topic? I could, I could jump in on that. Um, as I think, you know, ESG, particularly ESG investing, you know, is obviously growing incredibly fast and that's an important um, uh, driver of some behavior, but I think gen generally it seems to me, and I was just talking to a to a to a chief executive of a big European company about this, that that this this idea of stakeholder capitalism, you know, versus shareholder capitalism, and 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 the kind of things that like the business roundtable chamber of commerce is 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 talking about now seems that that cat is out of the bag, um, for lack of a better term, and 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 it, I think companies are doing that. I think that. ESG investors were maybe pretty early on in terms of, of sort of needling them to to change their behavior, but I think now it's coming from 
from all sides, from governments, from employees, from suppliers, from customers, all that, all that sort of stuff. And so I think that everything is pushing in that um, in that same direction. Like for example, like another interesting thing is is that like the stock exchanges. So this week, Nasdaq is applied for um, permission to essentially force the companies that list there to to have more diverse boards or else face delisting and that and that's kind of another interesting angle i think it's coming from all sides and you can call it esg which i think is mostly a kind of investment term but that's it's that was just the beginning and now it seems like it's only going to grow if i just quickly jump in there sorry julie um, okay, okay I'll, I'll, I'll go quickly. I wanted to just kind of share what Bloomberg is doing because there is a real change um, underway in terms of um, what we do with research around ESG because of the um, very strong interest from the investment community. Um, um, we, we've been building up our team of ESG analysts um, and um, one of our sort of marquee products in, in Bloomberg Intelligence are our company primers. Um, so you know, for, for literally thousands of companies, we now have analysts writing primers, you know, basic research talking about key themes and key um, investment uh, topics for each company. We've now added ESG primers um, for each of our companies. And that's how important and prevalent it's been that we are dedicating um, as much ESG coverage to each company um, as we can, aside from just adding, adding people, but adding real product um, behind it. I, I just quickly say that um... Clearly, in the UK, a lot of this is also being driven by changes to financial uh, regulations, what the Bank of England is doing, what the former governor, Mark Carney, has been doing and basically going around to the to the banks saying, what is your net zero plan? It is now a legal requirement. And that, it, that drive within government, to the extent that it might have been forgotten because of the pandemic, uh, is now doubled down on again uh, by the Biden presidency, the likely reintegration into the Paris Agreement, all that stuff uh, is going to be a big agenda now with huge momentum that you might have thought might have faltered a little bit because of the pandemic. Separate to that, I know that because of the pandemic, actually channels of communication via, ironically via what we're doing at the moment, from employees to very high ups have been quite fluid. And on things like Black Lives Matter, a number of things that may have been left unsaid inside an office environment have been said digitally. And I think that that will change things fundamentally when we get back to normal in terms of the expectations of employees, of their boards, of their bosses. Could I uh, just just add uh, a little bit? Um, yeah, I think uh, like Julie, uh, for the Financial Times, ESG, particularly as it pertains to investors, is a really huge topic for the for the FT. Uh, we actually have a, a newsletter dedicated to this every day. It's called Moral Money. Um, but my personal comment about ESG would be um, that I think an awful lot of work needs to be done in terms of definitions. What does the E actually mean? What is being represented by, you know, environmental, social and governance standards? Um, how, how compliant is the investing world to the definitions that are out there. And a lot of the time, the definitions are extremely vague. It's very easy for a company to claim that it's doing environmental, uh, abiding by environmental standards when it's actually not. Uh, the same is true of social, and the same is true of governance. So I think that it's an early stage uh, revolution in investing, um, and an awful lot of work needs to be done to cut out the fakery. Okay, just say, I can give you a bit of a scoop, which is Mark Carney, has given a series of lectures to the BBC, the first of which went today, the last of which is on climate change and some of the techie finance stuff behind that. That goes out every Wednesday of the next four weeks, well worth listening to on the subject. Christopher brought up a really interesting point about, um, about business travel, right? And you know, we know that um, it's been very, all of us staying home has been very good for the um, environment. Um, and you know, one of the things about the, about the, the turnaround that we see sort of post-vaccine is travel coming back and that can be a really exciting opportunity from an investment standpoint you think how much the travel companies airlines hotels cruises um, have sort of been beaten up and everyone expects personal travel to come back first lots of pent-up demand and then business travel to come back um, and with concern you know, with, 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 being, with companies being more attuned now to ESG being more attuned to the effects on the environment um, it'll be interesting to see if um, business travel maybe doesn't come back as much or as quickly um, 
uh, to, to the point where it was um, pre-pandemic. Well, thank you very much uh, for answering that question. And thank you so much for this wonderful panel. So Francesco and, uh, and team, thank you for uh, joining us at this important conference. Uh, and I hope you can st stay a little bit longer. I hand back to Jacob, the host of our conference. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so if we can ask, uh, if we can ask you to turn off your cameras and we'll get ready for the next oh. session. So the next session, what are financial services marketers looking for in their external media partnerships in the post-COVID world? So if I'd like to ask um, Tony Jarvis to now come on. Great, and um, yeah, there we go, can Tony. You can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Well, um, thank you, everybody. I mean, what a what an act to follow. Um, some of the uh, foremost news minds in the world, um, and actually leads beautifully into into what we're going to be discussing. The title for our um, our, our panel, very short, sharp panel uh, session today, is what are financial services marketers looking for? Uh, in their external partnerships in the in the post-COVID world. Trends, some trends have been accelerating this year, as we've been hearing, some have been turned completely upside down, and some underlying trends which continue um, nonetheless. Um, I'm going to introduce our esteemed panel uh, very briefly. We have um, a, a slight issue in that poor Helena, who I believe is on. Helena, can you hear us? Yes, I'm here. Hi, everyone. Right. Um, Helena has having some issues. Helena Jarabakova from CME Group is having some AV issues, but can hear us and we can hear her. So that's fantastic to have you with us, Helena. Uh, Dr. Winfred Dawn from UBS and Alison Harbour uh, from Investec. So um, in the preparation of, for our session today, we've been thinking about all the different dimensions of uh, media partnerships um, and what financial services marketers are looking for from those. And of course, it is a mix of brand, thought leadership, lead generation, and, and, and fostering new relationships, all of which, as we know, have been turned upside down. I think as we uh, run through a, a very short panel session today, we thought we'd look at it in three, look at the, uh, uh, tackle the issues, if you like, in, in three blocks. So the first of those is around using media partnerships to access and influence niche audiences that we wouldn't otherwise be able to reach. The second is very often the, the sort of uh, the mechanics of um, uh, 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 media partnerships in the content and convening. And then thirdly, ROI and data and measurement for all marketers. Um, and so that is absolutely key to, to, to everybody. So we'll tackle those um, uh, in turn. And so just thinking about the first of those, we're using media partnerships for access and influence. And listen to that panel session we've, we've just, uh, just heard. We, as marketers, want to align ourselves with that, those, news editors as closely as they will allow us to and the brands that they represent as closely as they will enable us to. So uh, to open our discussion, I wonder, um, Dr. Dawn, if I can um, uh, uh, call on you, please. As media suppliers are looking to up their game, we've got a lot of media suppliers listening in today from a sales and BD and operational perspective with the World Media Group and others. As those groups up, you know, invest and look to develop their capabilities in, um, in, in, in driving integrated, meaningful partnerships. What are the challenges that you see? Uh, what are the bear traps to avoid? And what are you doing? What are you doing to overcome them? If I can get a few comments from you to start on that, that'd be great, please. Thank you, Tony, for the question. And, and clearly it's one that I could talk for the next uh, 48 hours about. I'll try to be a little bit shorter. Um, so so um, at UBS, we've been doing, um, you know, media content partnerships with, uh, with uh, different publishing brands for the past uh, five or six years, really more than a dozen, um, and, and you can pick whatever you prefer. It's anything from Bloomberg, CNBC, New York Times, Washington Post, uh, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, so a lot of the, the, the brands that we've also seen of the, uh, on the, on the uh, previous panel. And I think there are a couple of learnings. So first of all, we very much believe in the format. Um, uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be, be doing this uh, on, a, on a continuous basis. We invest quite a lot of, of, of money and effort uh, into, these, into these partnerships. Something that we found relatively early on um, was that um, when, when these kind of partnerships are being pitched to us, uh, a lot of focus is being put on the creative and on the tech and design capabilities 
of the content studios that are associated with these brands. And, and, and that's understandable. And, and these, um, these companies and, and agencies, I'm, I'm almost inclined to call them, they are very, very good. You know, um, a lot of these publishing brands have built outstanding uh, capabilities. However, um, as you very often want to co-create content um, as a brand, rather than just buying something off the shelf uh, that is shiny and, and nice, um, what you're really after is also uh, an editorial um, capability that is on the same level as you as a consumer would see it on the editorial side mm. of that particular publishing brand. That isn't always the case, and this sounds terribly, uh, ter you know, terribly um, critical from my end. But what I'm saying is, um, you know, let's let's pick a subject like uh, sustainable investing, which was just uh, on the other panel, ESG investing. Um, it, it's obvious that from any of the established publishers on the editorial end, mm -hmm. I can find dozens of people who know this topic to such an extent that they could discuss it and develop content on a very, very sophisticated level. On the commercial content studio side, that's not necessarily always the case. So it requires sometimes a lot of effort um, uh, to, to get that. So to make a long story short, um, I think the, a lot of the capabilities are there, but the, the quality of the editorial stuff can always be even better um, because they have to deliver stories that sometimes are quite complex and sophisticated. And then the other thing is uh, the old uh, conversation around to what extent do we benefit from a brand halo effect from the publishing brand, right? This is this is thin ice, um, and I, I'm going to tread carefully here because I, I I'm very very mindful and respectful of the the, the editorial integrity, uh, and yet one of the reasons why we do partner with these brands is, well, because it's those brands, right? So mm. so when we do something with the New York Times or with the Financial Times, somehow we want their editorial credibility to rub off on that content. And different partners have found very different answers to that. Um, and, and some are, are, are very, very hands off and, and, and some are, um, uh, you know, uh, understandably concerned. And um, I will give uh, just one example. Um, you know, when, when you go through these proposals, you will, you will see a lot about um, promoting this content um, and promoting it on, on, on social handles. And when you dig a little bit deeper, then sometimes that means we're going to promote the content on the social handles of the content studio, which sometimes has 45 followers. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, 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 I'm carefully provoking a, a few people on, on this call. But what you really want is obviously the social handle of the editorial team, right? And, and, and some people do that and some people don't. And that's not a distinction between bad and good publishers. So it's it's really down to the individual agreement and down to the individual content partnership mm. to really whittle this out on a on a very detailed level and that can be a little bit blood sweat and tears um but generally the the result is always really really good that's really interesting isn't it i could hear i remember francesco talking earlier about um the uh, excitement he has around custom content so as we go and move in this journey over the next years it will be interesting to see where the new levels of comfort can be. We need to clearly yeah. re maintain a, a different uh, relationship and a, a clarity of a distinction between custom and editorial, but how those sit together in a really um, combined world, integrated world, will be fascinating to see. When yeah. we were prepping for this, um, Alison, you had some great comments thinking in terms of that access and influence um, uh, with media brands, to thinking about changing um, consumption behaviours. I wonder if I can ask you to just tease that, that, that point out that you made. Sure, thanks Tony. I guess, um, you know, one thing we can be grateful for this year is that we're all coming out of it with a lot more data than we went into it um, in 2020. And the publishers have got massive vats of this, this data and where that's incredibly valuable for brands is for them to be able to use that data to advise us on the kind of media consumption habit changes for our specific audiences. And where that really um, holds value is as we're thinking about the future. And so, as we know, creating valuable and useful content takes time, it takes resource, it, it often takes a good bit of budget as well. So as we're thinking about how do we plan for the future, being able to layer over publishers' data that says, 
we understand that these specific audiences that you're trying to reach have actually changed the way that they consume data. They've changed whether it's format, whether it's um, time of day, whether it's their interaction levels, how much they're prepared to, to interact with this kind of content. This has changed. And so as, as you, the brand, are thinking about the sorts of things that you can do to engage with this audience, it looks very different from audience A than it does to audience B. So by saying these are the predictions for the year or the, the couple of years ahead, and of course this is a million dollar question I appreciate, so maybe our timeframes are a bit shorter than what they ordinarily would be, but to be able to turn around to a brand and say here's the insight that we've got access to, here's the crystal ball that we can be able to give you some kind of predictions for the next six months, this is how you need to think about the ways that you can engage with these audiences differently based on what we can see from the media consumption habits. So if I know there was some talk in the previous session about business travel, if business travel is back on the cards again in 2021, what does that mean for a CFO audience that's got European client bases versus a more desk bound institutional investor or asset manager? What does that mean in terms of the way that they're gonna consume media in the next six months? And so how do we work together then with the media partners to be able to generate the right kinds of, of content that, that land well with that audience as we're thinking about the integration with the client journey? And at what stage are we trying to raise awareness or convert or generate interest or drive advocacy based on these different audiences? Mm, that's interesting, isn't it? I mean, lots of the pitches that we all receive from these media providers talk about understanding their their database and how their consumers are, or how their, their readers and, and, and viewers are consuming data. But looking ahead, surveying that audience, looking at the looking at societal changes certainly now and how that then plays out into media consumption and therefore successful media partnerships, that would be um, absolutely key to follow. And um, couldn't agree more. Okay, um, in terms of uh, the next block of content uh, that we wanted to cover, it was a block about content. Um, uh, digital saturation has obviously been rife this year across both uh, written content and, and viewable content, and of course, the webinar fatigue that everybody is on uh, 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 on Zoom calls all day and all night. And uh, I wonder, Helen, if we can bring you in there. I know you, you have a lot of very, very um, niche partnerships and a plethora of uh, event engagements that you've been continuing with this year, some fascinating numbers that you were sharing with us. I wonder if you can give us your sense on, okay, in the virtual digitally saturated post-COVID world, what is the role for an external media, an external convening partner to help bring audiences together? Um, I, I hope you can still hear us and your connection is still there. Um, can I pass to you on that point, please? Yes, no, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I am here and I apologize you can't see me. Uh, no, great setup. Thank you, Alison. Actually, I totally agree. Um, all of our clients had to switch to working from home overnight, just like us. Their commuting routines have been totally disrupted. And these are the tip these are typically the routines we uh, where a lot of our clients used to read the content we published with media partners. So we're having to radically rethink these touch points to make sure that uh, we can serve the content to our targets when they're looking for it. And that's new for a lot of us. You know, we've managed to expand our persona work at CME Group um, and better understand our customer journeys. We're trying to get to customer 360 um, next year. We know that we need to remove frictions that prevent them uh, from switching between channels and provide us in what we now fully understand is a non-linear buy buying journey. So just going back to digital events and the content uh, that's generated at those events, um, you know, it's it's meant whether that digital event has been real time or on demand. Uh, it's meant that we now have to create new digital assets and think about the broader customer journey and figure out how to market these pieces of content effectively, pre, during, and post event. And just to provide some context, as you mentioned, uh, Tony, earlier, we run 260 events with third parties this year, and that's out of a total of 683. Um, events this year and we've learned a lot and there have been a lot of teething problems just as much as I'm sure um, my, my panelists have point? seen today. You, sure. Sorry to interrupt Helena but was that 680 odd that CME group overall is engaging with and then the 200 number was for EMEA? No 200, 260 um, global third, events with third parties out of right. 683. Total. Total. Understood. Okay, it's a fascinating number. A lot of clients, and a lot of, we take a lot of temperature of a lot of marketers across this year. 
who have been really um, reticent to engage in the virtual in, uh, external industry events, well, certainly in the early uh, point of, of COVID, because they were, were thinking, let's sit back behind the parapet, concentrate on our proprietary events, and um, uh, uh, come back to come back to face-to-face -face events when when society allows. But with that now pushing out to seemingly Q2, Q3 next year, we're seeing a lot of uh, reinterest in um, engaging with external events because we can't go that long without uh, that that form of engagement. So I was sorry to interrupt you. I was fascinated by that. I totally agree, and I think there have been some media partners that uh, managed to. Um, innovate and involve their, especially their technology partnerships and provide us uh, with solutions that we needed. So I did want to actually just list off some positives uh, with the rest of the audience. Um, they certainly, these digital events certainly have a broader reach. Uh, there are no geographical or time boundaries. Better data acquisition, that's a big one for us. Um, I've seen impressive tie-ups between firms where publisher became a sponsor and the host uh, um, us, the firm, where we've um, shared the content and managed the content with our audiences. I've seen some um, nice opportunities where uh, video um, has been inserted uh, between live uh, conference segments, speakers being beamed from all, all sorts of locations, real-time polls and questions from audiences uh, that shaped live panels in a way I haven't seen at a face-to-face -face conference. So these are all uh, great positives. Um, and, you know, obviously we still have a lot of work to do with media partners on, on how to kind of continue evolving these formats and make sure that uh, we continue um, producing the right content for our customers at the right time. Uh, and I do actually one last point on uh, niche publishers. We definitely work with some niche publications, uh, trade publications in particular. We like um, publishers that continue to focus on, their, on, on the growth of their subscriber base. We like when their subscribers prefer to stay within the publisher's domain. And that's when we actually start um, blending our CME group produced content with the editorial content. And that creates um, a brand new um, experience for our readers. Um, so as long as we can figure out how to, how to manage the third party data that's shared with us, um, uh, you know, we are happy. Mm, very interesting, isn't it? I, I think when we were prepping for this discussion, we were talking about the, the journey that, that virtual events have been on. Virtual event users, senior uh, bankers and relationship managers, um, thought leaders inside your own organisations, ourselves as marketers and as uh, those in industry. Um, and there's clearly innovation needed. We are that hopefully we will not be engaging in two hour webinars uh, uh, this time next year, irrespective of where society is and where the pandemic is. But there's that need for innovation, and Winfrey, you put this really well, innovation with credibility, that we don't just become too gimmicky in terms of what we're trying to do. I don't know if you had a, an additional comment there, or um, uh, I know there were one or two great examples from earlier. No, I, I think you, you, you captured that really well. I, I do think that both in terms of, to of storytelling, but also in terms of uh, sort of uh, evolving any kind of content program through different um, channels and, and formats, um, it is yes, it is important to to engage the audience uh, through uh, whatever um, format uh, and device suits them best and 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 the time and and certainly these evolve as the previous uh, speakers have also said. You know, um, a, a good example is um, we've we've just finished producing a, sort of a docu series um, in house, well not really in house with a professional uh, company obviously behind it that uh, that uh, goes into um you know the usage of alternative data in um in illustrating economic problems and that could be a very dry topic and um, so the brief um to the company was this has to feel like netflix and it has to be as entertaining as netflix which is a tall order uh, for any financial services company i'm i'm incredibly satisfied with the result you'll be able to see it a week from now uh, but I guess what I'm saying is, you know, you, you constantly have to raise the bar. And um, because uh, especially this year due to COVID, everybody has been huddled in front of Amazon and Netflix and so on. So almost subconsciously, uh, your expectation level of what good content, especially good uh, documentary and, 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 and non-fictional content looks like, uh, will have, uh, will have uh, raised. Having said that, we are very, very cautious of anything that feels too gimmicky. Um, because it, it it may serve to create that initial spike of visitors to any kind of website. 
but that spike is going to last for what three days and and then the whole thing is that so so we always try and go for something that that has legs and that will be interesting to people um you know four weeks from now just as it is today rather than you know a, a one-hit wonder and then you need to move on to the next thing Mm, it's fascinating. That, that need for innovation, I know that Deutsche Bank and, and Jacob and Christoph have uh, pioneered this year a, a really innovative, engaging way to um, a, a, a network with attendees at Cybos, the biggest banking event out there. And I know that you know there is some serious challenges with that, but real credibility that comes from that pioneering spirit as well and taking that audience on a journey um, in a really careful, thoughtful way. I loved also what Kieran was saying earlier but with 300 pounds and a, something better than a Samsung phone, or a, a, any kind of phone, uh, that um, you could engage with a really, really um, immersive VR environment to network with others at, at events. So that, that's certainly coming our way, isn't it? We could go on. I know that, uh, we, that we, this is the sort of discussion that could be a two hour panel. Um, and I want to make sure that we cover this last point, um, this last block um, around ROI measurement and data. One of the great, um, opportunities with the current environment is that so much more can be measured when we take events virtually, when we take you know, so much of the, the, the buyer journey now digitally. So Alison, let me turn to you. What are the new challenges that you're grappling with and what are you doing about them in terms of data and ROI measurement? Well, I, I guess that, you know, the data piece, this is a bit of a gift now. And I know there were some earlier conversations around digital digital marketing and, and not letting that sort of overwhelm the, the general marketing uh, piece just because of the circumstances we find ourselves in. But nonetheless, I think um, we talk a lot in marketing about quality over quantity, but I think in many environments, and it's not just in, in a marketing environment, but also with business stakeholders, they're often a bit dazzled by quantity metrics. And so there are plenty of business stakeholders and marketing stakeholders who will be delighted with hundreds or thousands of people that register to an event, um, rather than being able to go into the detail around, well, what's the quality? What was the actual outcome? What happened as a result of, of this great thing that we built? And so what I'd love to see the conversations with media partners start to evolve into next year is where they can help us on some of those quality metrics. And so being able to blend what their understanding is of data for the specific audiences that we're trying to target and thinking about that before, during an activation and after an activation. And so before uh, the activation, the sorts of things that I think um, publishers can help us with is giving us a sense based on the audience that we're trying to reach what kind of content, what kind of themes are they interested in? Have they stopped reading content on a particular topic where actually we thought that they were interested in that? And are they now reading all sorts of other content? Were they reading loads of emerging markets content up until three months ago, but clearly their strategy's shifted and now they're going for less high risk areas. So can we engage in a different conversation, leveraging that insight that comes from the publishers? When we get to quality metrics around um, an activation, we really need to understand what the quality of interaction is. What do people really care about? Not just did they show up and do they fall into some sort of generic job title description, but what was it that they actually cared about and how did the activation, whether it's a virtual event or it's some sort of content series or whatever the activation is, how did that genuinely interest the particular participants that were involved in the target audience? So which bits did they interact with? What were they curious about? What, what changed after this activation in terms of their behaviours? Did they then start looking at other content related to the same thing? Did they change their sorts of behaviours in media consumption um, with that particular publisher? Did they care so much about the content that they've gone on and shared it with others and they've become an advocate for the perspective that we were able to provide them with? So those qualities Quality metrics are tough to come by, we know that, and if it was easy, we would have solved it by now. But I think there is real value in the media partners and the brands coming together to be able to do this together, because none of our clients exist in Investex world alone or in UBS's world alone. They exist in their entire world, which means that they are on the FT site, they're on UBS's site, they're on my site. They're existing in all of these different environments. So when I can together with some of those publishers, we've got a much more meaningful output and a quality conversation over quantity. Fascinating, Alison, thank you so much. Um, so we're out of time, we're almost out of time. I would love to ask each panellist, please, just to close with, we were going to go with two, but just one piece of advice, please, from each uh, uh, panellist on either what you would um, ask uh, 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 marketers to think about before they're engaging in their next media partnership, or um, what you would ask the next salesperson who is going to pitch you an integrated partnership from a media 
uh, uh, supplier what, what you would advise them to, uh, 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 to think about before they approach you. Uh, can I go to you first, Helena, please? Can I answer, can I come back? I, I do actually have one answer for each. So uh, let me start with the first question. Certainly when speaking to, to media houses, um, I'd love us to um, talk in more detail about customer intelligence on readers and subscribers um, and you know have that inserted into your pitches. Um, show us how you will support our efforts in terms of metrics, have that conversation with us upfront, just going back to what Alison's mentioned. And in terms of the second question, uh, for us, it's all about lead acquisition. As product marketeers, we really focused on, you know, delivering um, on our um, revenue goals and um, is the media partner well positioned uh, to help us deliver on those goals? Perfect, thank you. And Alison, to you next, please. Uh, so I'll answer the second question around if we're talking to media partners, what can we do? And I guess it's getting specific on, on three core things. Know exactly who we're targeting, know exactly how we can help those particular clients with what we're targeting and at what stage of the client journey we're focused on. And then if, if a media partner can come to me and say, this is where our audience overlaps with exactly what you're trying to achieve, then let's talk turkey. Mm -hmm. Very good, thank you. And uh, Winfrey, let me come to you, please. Yeah, there's really not much that I that I can add to that. I think all uh, and everything has been said. It's it's really really important um, that that you bring the necessary uh, depth of understanding um, that that we can together um, create a story that is new and that helps your audience to to engage, but also to understand things that maybe need a bit of uh, of education. And then, you know, let us know how far you're willing to go in order to promote this um, and to make this truly a co-branded effort. Yeah, that's a key point, isn't it? And I'll just say thank you, everybody. I know Jacob is messaging me that we need to uh, uh, move on. Um, but uh, thank you all so much. And a last comment from me would be that just in terms of media partnerships that are going to be that are going to last to your point, Winfried, they need to be meaningful, really meaningful to the target audience and overserved. A flooded audience needs something that is going to truly elevate them in their role and be meaningful in their marketplace uh, and be aspirational for them. So yeah, uh, fascinating. Thank you all so much, um, Jacob. Let me hand back back to you. Thank you. Hey, me too. Hi, Thank you very much, John. Another fantastic panel, and a special thanks to Tony. He's been a great partner with EI Advisory on this program. Right. So, Amy, over to you for the final fantastic panel of the day. Fantastic. Um, and I'm really excited to um, invite my mm -hmm. panellists to turn on their videos if you are lurking in the background. Um, I'm really excited to be talking today about brand, vision and culture. Um, and I have Josh Dibbons, hopefully, um, who is BlackRock's UK head of MEA marketing. Um, David Weldon, who is former CB CMO at RBS, not CBO. Um, and Lorena Hilton, um, MD, Global Head of Product and Comms and CSR. And I have David Excellent and Josh. Um, Lorena, are you there? I'm here. Sorry, I can't. Sorry, you can't see me, but I'm here. <laughs> and there seems to be a gremlin in a few people's systems, so it's not just you. Um, we saw that it worked great for Helena just now, so um, I'm sure we can. Yeah, it made, it made me feel a bit better. <laughs> Not just you. Look, so um, just to sort of intro, I think, you know, you, you all three of you have fascinating stories, and I could very easily sort of turn the mic over to you. It would take our whole time just telling the stories of how you built um, incredible culture programs at your organization. Um, a little bit of an echo, so I might say if you could just unmute me for your talking. Um, I'm not sure anyone else can hear that. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things and one of the words of the year for me has been pivoting. Um, and I think I'd like to start there, really, with um, how important it is to have a really strong and clear corporate culture in place. Um, have that well understood and well um, grounded throughout the organization to enable um, a company to pivot effectively and, and take everybody with them in times of, of difficulty and challenge, um, which I think we've all certainly seen this year. My pivot um, was to step down from that West Group, as it's now named, 
Um, just as the purpose was launched and the name of the company was changed from RBS to NatWest Group, which was work I'd been intimately involved in. And I noticed, so my pivot was to join the world of slow living. I won't talk about that. What I will talk about is how well NatWest have pivoted because the purpose statement that was launched in February, February the 14th, uh, was amended pretty quickly when COVID came along to take account of good times and bad times. So hats off for doing that. But I think the real thing that I've observed my old company do is use that purpose as the North Star to drive their activity. So, you know, nice to watch it from the outside. And I have to say, um, in deference to all my colleagues who are working their socks off, nice to not be doing it on the inside as well. I think that's the, the beauty of stepping up. Sorry. Shall I continue while the others try and work with their tech? I mean, I do think the, you know, one of the things that's observable is how difficult it has been for everybody to get used to working from home, but how impressive it has been. Uh, and actually this use of technology, which on the whole has been seamless, a couple of teething problems now, has enabled that. But, you know, I do think when you look underneath that, there are some issues that we should all be concerned about. And let me talk about culture here, because I, I do think it's been difficult for people to share their problems, because um, it's much more difficult to read, for instance, Amy, how you're feeling looking at you on the screen than it was if would be if I was sitting in front of you. So the whole notion of mental well-being and how people have coped, I think companies have done well with. And actually, if you're going to put a purpose out you have to be able to live it and be seen to live it. And I think especially in the bad times. And as I say, you know, hats off to my old colleagues at NatWest because they've been doing that. And I think the couple of other examples I've seen, I was um, doing an interview the other day for somebody who was talking about how they'd done uh, check-ins with people that didn't report to them, how the Exco had carved up the next level down and said, right, call these people and check in and how that had helped everybody get to know each other better. So ironically, in this extremely difficult year, many people have managed to pivot to get to know the people that work for them better and to be more effective in what they've done. How are we doing on the other two? <laughs> I think we've definitely got Lorena and her line sounded pretty clear. So I might go over to you, Lorena, and, um, no, and ask. Do my best to fill in. Thank you. Hi, yeah, thanks so much for that. Yeah, I'd, I'd really just build on, on what David has, has just said. This has been the year to pivot for sure. Um, and I think, you know, it's not about starting from scratch. It's really about building on a strong purpose, a strong foundation and adapting and being able to adapt. So, you know, we, we launched our, our purpose and our brand strategy in, in 2017 internally first. Um, and then we went extern externally um, in 18. And then we were building up with sort of lots of good groundwork behind us uh, during 2019 to our 150th anniversary this year. Um, and so we were all ready to talk about our founding purpose and how we can now connect that to our existing purpose. And the pandemic happened and we had to pivot very quickly to salvage that work because actually it was still very, very relevant and important, but we had to make sure it didn't sound like it was falling out of the sky um, and completely out of context and out of sync with what was going on you know, around the world, infecting everybody. So we were able to, to adapt it. And actually what that allowed us to do was really demonstrate the, res the bank's response to the pandemic from a, um, from a, certainly from a client perspective. And there was a huge momentum there, but also from an employee one in terms of really making sure employees were safe and their wellbeing was at the forefront. And of course, society and the bank was very involved in, in, a, in a very large response, actually, from a societal perspective. So that, that really built on our purpose. Um, and in a way, it allowed us to really think about new formats and new ways of doing things, which I think, you know, some very good stuff has come out of. And we're currently working on a, a, a new way of demonstrating that, the bank's response in much more granularity, which we'll, we'll be looking to publish in the next few weeks. So, yeah, I think if we didn't have all that foundation, we would have probably struggled but it allowed us to move quickly. Great and do you think that that was in part because you had the established channels and people had trust in those channels or do you think um, you know it was a, it was a sort of more ephemeral piece than that and then you were able to build through new channels? 
Uh, yeah, less about channels, really. I think the internal audience has been, the employee audience has been critical. They're very familiar with the purpose now. We've spent a lot of time really embedding it through the organisation. And obviously, as, as sort of ESG um, becomes more and more critical, we're developing it constantly to, to, to sort of embed the, well, the social piece is very clear, but definitely embed the environment piece and, and obviously the governance piece. So I think employees are very familiar with, with what the bank stands for and they they know their role within it. Um, and, you know, we'd been working to really rally everyone behind this as a kind of common goal, if you like, for the last two or three years. Um, I think actually the pandemic brought it all to the fore because employees, the, the, the response from employees to the bank's response has been so positive in terms of pride and morale and productivity that actually it's like it's, it's really accelerated things. I mean, I know it's a, a terrible thing that we've all had to go through and, and that has happened, but in a way, I think it's really unified um, employees, despite working from home and not really being together. They, people are more connected than ever. Great. Um, I have a message saying that Josh is on audio. Josh, can you hear me? Hey, guys. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry about that. It just um, wasn't really flowing. You've come in at a perfect moment. Um, I don't know when you came in, but um, Lorena was just talking about ESG, which um, I was going to do some filling for you, but um, I'd love to hand over to you now and, and ask you the same question um, about, you know, whether or not you have to have that sort of strong culture in place um, in order to be able to really pivot successfully as a company. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I think that uh, I think it's it's really important that you have that cultural foundation if you are going to change your strategy, and and we have made some pretty big changes over the last year to really embed sustainability into our, our brand and culture pillars. Um, I agree with the, the comments earlier around the pandemic has definitely accelerated the rush to, to sustainable investing. And we're seeing investors moving assets into sustainable solutions. And that's obviously creating a lot of flows in the investment industry um, and, and actually into BlackRock. But I think if I was to jump into sustainability, I think the one aspect that has probably been hit the hardest is the social side of sustainability, because ultimately we're in this health crisis. There's mass unemployment that's starting to happen. You're seeing social divides widening and obviously companies are, are going out of business. And so this is where from a cultural standpoint and a firm standpoint, we are having to pivot parts of our business and also our, our, our marketing and communication strategies. But ultimately, I believe that companies have a social duty to support really four key areas. And I'd say that first area is around employee well-being. I think that COVID obviously has forced a lot of people to work from home, and that's been very testing, and a lot of people are suffering from burnout. But also, it's, it's put onto the table very much the mental health aspect and I think it's important that we try and support our employees around mental health and awareness of it. And so what we've been trying to do at BlackRock is we've been trying to support our employees through things like offering them counseling, setting up workshops around building resilience, um, uh, other, other types of educational tools and resources around dealing with stress and anxiety, and offering even things like free meditation apps. So employee well-being, I think, is critical. The other piece is obviously social impact. Um, we work with a lot of charities. We work with a lot of uh, community businesses. But it's really important that we use our capital and our resources to try and help the people that need it the most right now through COVID. And we've actually invested around two and a half million pounds into various charities, the likes of National Emergencies Trust, St. John's Ambulance, etc. cetera. Um, and I think it's really important as a, as, as a company to support local communities and, and charities. And then really the third point is around clients and the companies that we invest in. You know, we're a fiduciary to our clients um, and that means we want to protect their capital, we want to protect their investments, but also we want to try and look after and, and support the companies that we believe are strong long-term investments. And, and a great example of that is that during the height of the pandemic, we saw we saw 
many companies that were struggling, but one in particular potentially was going to go into administration and lose around 30 to 40,000 employees. And as a consortium with other investment groups and banks, we were able to help them get the lines of credit they so desperately needed. And so whilst we chose this company based on its investment credentials, we see that our capital is actually being used for a social purpose. And then the final one is around building a more inclusive economy. You know, we've seen these social divides widening between the wealthy and the poor during COVID. We've seen racism and the issues around that become stronger and stronger in the US and the UK. And I think it's our duty as companies to try and actually build more diverse and inclusive workforces and industries um, so that we can we can better serve that social purpose that's so so evidently needed right now. Yeah, um, I, th I think there's an interesting point there about um, actions and communications and which ones of those sort of create the culture more um, and how we sort of weave those together. But before I sort of pose that as a specific question, I think, David, did you have a follow up point on? Yeah, I mean, it's really a bit of a build on what Josh was saying, but many of these things that Josh just described, many financial companies should probably ponder why it was that they weren't doing all of that before the pandemic, because nearly all of that should have been paid attention to before. And, and there's a harsh light being put on companies. And in fact, it was the famed Larry Fink letter that started that a couple of years back when he was asking companies to prove the delivery of ESG, not just say they were going to do it. So it's great to hear um, that there's lots of pivoting going on, but I just want to underline that most of it should have been happening before. Uh, and I do think the people that work inside financial institutions have been asking that question as well. So it'd be interesting to see what happens when we get out the other side. Yeah, I, I fully agree. Um, and I think that's that's kind of the the sort of point of the question really is, uh, you know, how do you communicate culture? So I think, Lorena, you came um, close to this when you, you talked about launching internally first and really um, making sure that a, a culture build or a culture program is, is led and owned by those employees um, and then becomes all pervasive um, rather than necessarily being sort of campaign or tactical led. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to sort of unpick that slightly because I think that's where we start to get into the impact of brand, which is overall the uh, point of the panel. Um, but can I ask you to go, um, go into that a little bit, Lorena? Yes, of course. Um, yeah, I think I mean, I'm not responsible for culture at the bank. I'm responsible for brand. But these these two things have to be completely integral to each other, for sure, for it to work. Um, when we started the development, I, I started off this this project wanting to reposition the bank um, from a brand perspective. So first and foremost, I was thinking externally, if I'm honest, and that was because the bank was under, as, the, as was the industry, but our bank was under significant reputational pressure for obvious reasons, we're all aware of those. Um, and it was really important that we were able to counter that um, and not counter it with spin, if you like, but with real stories. Um, and so, but as I started to develop this, I realized that what we've been guilty of as an organization, but also I think, again, you know, many years before that from a industry perspective was that we always communicated out from a brand perspective and expected our employees to sort of embrace it and, and pick it up without really engaging them with it from the start and that was a massively missed opportunity so we sort of took a step back and said actually before we even think about the external perspective or external um, expression of it we should start from from the inside and we were obviously wanting to start with the purpose and we wanted to rally our employees which is very diverse you know we're a huge 80 plus thousand organization, multiple different types of businesses, but also, you know, a lot of infrastructure groups, like all of the, the guys that are on this panel, they understand what I mean, including yourself probably. Um, and we needed to give people an understanding of sort of sort of a fresh understanding of, of what we stood for and what we each come to, to work to do every day. Um, and so that was where the purpose really started. And we felt that we wanted employees to find their role within that or find their space within that and say, okay, maybe I work in risk management or, or maybe I, I'm a 
I'm a, I'm a corporate finance banker or, or maybe I work in brand and communications, but how do I contribute to that to collectively deliver this firm in a consistent way? Um, and so that was our starting point, really. We wanted each and every one to be part of it and it to be two way rather than communicating. This is what we stand for. You must adhere. We wanted employees to say, oh, this makes sense. Now, how does that work for me? It doesn't matter where I sit in the organization. And there was such a huge response to it internally when we launched it because employees were completely starved, if you like, of positivity. And they suddenly saw something that was bigger picture and felt very strongly about sort of navigating themselves within it or orientating themselves within it. So we did that for a whole year before we even thought about externally. Of course, whatever's internal is external immediately. So it was obviously sort of seeping outside the organization. That was fine. Um, but that was a really, we created an internal hub. We asked everyone to post on it. And actually that hub today is still running strong and people are posting comments on it every day. So, you know, it has been, it has been very positive in that respect. Externally, we moved to a kind of client testimonial campaign, if you like. And, but we used real bankers, um, real employees versus something that felt staged. And again, just wanted to demonstrate what our, our bankers and our employees do every day to help their clients realize their plans and ambitions. And, and that was kind of the, 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 the crux of, of what we were doing. So I think internal is critical. Otherwise, you'd never get that, um, that really kind of ingrained and, and um, a bank-wide response. It sounds so simple when you say it like that, but it is anything but, and I think we all yeah, know think, that. <laughs> yeah, a lot of work. <laughs> um, David, I'd, I'd like to pose that one to you, actually, in, in um, any previous roles, really. Do you think you can communicate culture, or do you think it's something that builds? How do you, you know, what's your view? Well, obviously, you know, I was five years at what was then RBS, and I was part of, um, I'll describe it as the cleanup team. You know, the bank was in recovery. Um, led by Ross McEwen and then actually the purpose at the time was serve customers well it doesn't sound like rocket science and um, but it was necessary because it was a reminder for everybody that worked in the bank that that was the um, reason to exist and we had to refocus on that and actually I think there's a combination where you have to understand that brand service brands are built from the inside out so you have to as Lorraine, Lorraine so eloquently said take people with you on the journey but you also have to set the tone from the top and the exco and the board need to own culture and cultural change and it needs to get measured and needs to be tracked and actually if you look back at the data that ross inherited it was not it was a fairly um, poor culture it was bottom quartile um, as measured uh, by the time i was i left it was top quartile um, now that is hard yards and you can't do it through communication it, it's what you do it's not what you say but they have to be in sync um and actually i do think you know this this year that's really been in focus because the brands that have been saying things that are out of sync with their actions have been called out by their own people uh, as somebody said earlier in a way that perhaps people wouldn't have done um, in days gone by because of that mysterious thing of you know the corporate culture things aren't don't work like that around here but yeah build brands inside out and do it with authenticity is what I learned along the way um, and another thing that I'll pick up from what you were just saying then and, and I think it was referred to earlier is actually um, how your how you shape your culture and, and your corporate culture is ever more um, uh, obvious, I think, or, or accessible to the outside, and it does become a definer. You know, we no longer live in worlds where culture stays within the four walls and only is really observable if you work there. Um, everything with, you know, with social media, with everything else, you know, it is very easy to um, get the tone or get the feel for a corporate culture before you join. And so I'm going to bring it to Josh and um, ask you a sort of closing question if you like on how much is a, a brand really intrinsically linked nowadays to its corporate culture um, and what's the sort of relationship you see um, moving forward um, Josh yeah I think um, I think I think brands are, are very much linked to their culture um, at BlackRock we have we have four guiding principles that ultimately um, are the backbone of our internal culture. It, it is how um, employees um, 
it's what sorry it's what employees hold themselves against it's the benchmarks that they hold themselves against it's how they hold themselves accountable and so i do think it's inextricably linked um the four principles that we have are we have a principle around innovation because we believe in trying to drive our industry forward through innovation um, and, and trying to provide better solutions to our clients the next one is around being a fiduciary to our clients and it's it's this piece around decision making that is focused on the client at the core of everything we do and, and putting putting our clients first. The next one is about being one black rock. You know, we're, we're a global firm, but we try and operate as a single entity if we can, because that's how we can make the best use of our culture and our resources. And then finally, it is obviously about performance. It's, a, it's about trying to drive impact within our own industry, but driving impact outside of our industry and even contributing to society so those are our four guiding principles and, and they really are the backbone of everything that we do at blackrock great thank you very much um, lorena coming to you on on that question that that link between brand and culture i think you you spoke eloquently on it before but if i might tweak the question slightly because you did address it before um have you got any thoughts on on measurement or that kind of um how you you think about potentially salience or, or those kind of brand measurement in relationship to culture yeah, it's a very big question for the yeah. closing minute i'm sorry <laughs> okay it's all right um we do well what i can tell you is that we do, from the day we we launched um the brand purpose and and all of the material that went with it as well as then the external campaign later on a quarterly basis we do measure via our employee barometer in the employee um, perspective on that, both from an awareness perspective. So are they aware of the purpose? Do they agree with it? But then all of the um, sort of brand attributes that go with that and the campaign materials, and then do, so, so are they aware, um, do they agree and do they engage um, across the number of channels that we work on as well? So we are able to measure that consistently. Um, and as new material comes, we, we we test that as well. And it's really important because, as I said, we're a very diverse organisation um, with, you know, many, many branches in Germany, um, a, you know, big branch network in Germany. And then we have sort of an institutional business in other regions. Um, we, as I said, we have a big infrastructure or support functions as well. I mean, employees need to, it needs to resonate with them across different cultures and and, uh, and areas. So yes, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to say that um, awareness is very high and, and support is still very high. And actually, we, we, we obviously measure our brand uh, perception too against that, against a number of attributes. And what I will say is it was nudging up. Um, but during the pandemic, it has increased significantly. And I think you know, in, as I said before, employees feel very motivated, they feel very proud, um, and they feel um, uh, that they want to, you know, they want to rally behind the organisation, which is going through a whole transformation anyway, from a, a strategic perspective. So we definitely have some great momentum, and we w really want to build on that going into 2021. Great, thank you. And I will also say I've had a few questions that relate specifically to Deutsche's programmes, um, all very complimentary, but I don't have time to ask you them. So um, I'm just passing on the love from the questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very David, much. That's very kind. Uh, David, a, a couple of final minutes from you. A couple of thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think uh, we, we all in financial services get absolutely used to what gets measured gets done, um, but it is getting underneath the numbers sometimes. So understanding, you know, employee engagement and pride, as Lorraine just said, is absolutely key. So if, if, if I go back, you know, I was uh, I joined Barclays, uh, I was hired by Bob Diamond four months before LIBOR happened, uh, and when that happened, um, people were ashamed to say they worked for the bank. Um, and one of my colleagues said they worked for a bank at an event and had a glass of wine thrown over them, just to give you that. So, you know, the, to rebuild emotional engagement is a difficult thing. And to make sure it's done so that it's authentic and you're tracking it and you can show the pride and loop it back around. But of course, ultimately, you have to mind the gap between what you're doing internally and what you're delivering externally. And it's the customers that must feel the love of the rebuilding of a culture. Uh, because brands then develop so probably the brand that we managed to reboot and rebirth really effectively was the royal bank of scotland in scotland um, which had suffered 
from the attempt to build the global brand RBS, but has recovered by just applying the simple principles driven through serving customers well and people being pride in what they're doing, proud of what they're doing and doing it well. Well, thank you. I, I would say thank you to all three of you. Um, I've had, really enjoyed that discussion. I think, um, you know, thank you to Josh for pivoting with the tech and, and rejoining us so quickly. Um, and uh, to, the, to both you, David and Lorena, for your thoughts on this topic. Um, as with all of them today, I really I think we could have gone on in, in much greater detail, but it's um, much more fun to gallop through lots of fantastic topics um, and, and cover loads of ground. So I think, you know, that's been a really insightful session. Um, hi, Christoph, how are you doing? Thank you very much, uh, Amy and your uh, panel. I think that was uh, just uh, great to see that wrap up because when uh, we are looking back at what we've experienced today, uh, in sort of, sort of a, a short wrap up, we started the day in, in getting a, a, a view from a journalist how the uh, environment has changed and what the challenge is when you do no longer experience like the, the little tweaks and uh, giveaways uh, uh, that you experience when you, when you talk to uh, 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 people. Then we, we, we looked at a very specific creative approach um, on financial literacy, which is you know, uh, important to all of us because we as a financial service industry, we have to make sure that we are uh, as simple as possible to understand uh, and that most of the people can navigate uh, also privately uh, in, this, uh, in this new environment. Um, and therefore, a great, great uh, uh, example shown uh, by Bino and the Bank of England. And then um, we heard about the relevance of digital marketing as well. Um, how it will change uh, uh, or the importance of relevance in digital markets, better to say, uh, digital marketing, uh, so that you really um, have to focus on uh, less is more, but you have to know when you get out with relevant uh, content. Then we, uh, we looked at uh, uh, the, uh, the, the very complex environment in our editorial panel that is still with us, but that also offers loads of opportunities for change, uh, be it uh, in the situation of uh, the vaccination, but also be it uh, into ESG uh, and the future of uh, business. Uh, and then we looked, in, uh, we looked at media partnerships, how media partnerships increasingly become data partnerships and fantastic how you, Amy, and your esteemed uh, uh, panel have wrapped, it up, uh, wrapped this up in terms of, you know, everything only makes sense when a company uh, looks at uh, their, uh, uh, their brand and their purpose. And as Lorena impressively uh, described, if you give staff the opportunity to have a hand in driving the brand, then you get uh, you know, everybody on board. Uh, and also we, we heard great examples of uh, mental health uh, focus, which in my view is absolutely pivotal because so many people uh, now struggle with this situation. And it's great that companies really take this seriously and don't see it as a nice to have. So all in all, super impressive. And with that, Amy, thank you for your moderation. We hand back to our esteemed Jacob. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Christoph and Amy. And thank you to everyone that's joined or everybody that's helped out to pull this fantastic agenda together today. So big thanks to uh, Tony Jarvis and Belinda Barker. Thank you to Andrew Carrier for the amazing tweets that he's going to turn into a uh, report that he will send round to everyone. But, uh, you know, amazing panels, amazing speakers. So thank you to everyone. Amazing. And, uh, Which way around? That way. To the host. <laughs> um, we still have a final session three, but unfortunately we, we couldn't do it for the full, uh, the full hundreds that were, were signed up for the webinar. But those that uh, are going to be joining us, uh, we look forward to seeing you on Zoom at 4.30. So with that, uh, I'll draw this uh, session, this year's session to a close and uh, look forward to seeing you next year as well. So thank you again. Thank, thank you. you Bye. Thanks.